Okay, let's get started here. Um, so good morning. Uh, it's good afternoon of the East Coast and uh, I think we've also got some good good evenings and some good nights uh, as well uh, joining us today. So uh, welcome. Uh, so this is day two of um, workshop number two. Um, we're focusing this workshop on uh, state of the art in um, science data processing systems. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Andrew Bingham. I'm uh, uh, one of the four um, chairs of the uh, working group. Um, and I'm also um, a division manager here at JPL uh, for mission systems and operations. Uh, so yesterday we uh, took a look at, um, we kicked off the, the uh, of the uh, workshop. I think we had around about 160 people at peak. Um, I know over 300, 350 people have registered, so we're going to see a lot of people coming uh, through the meeting uh, over the course of the week. Uh, so yesterday we uh, provided a context for this uh, workshop. Uh, we heard from headquarters about their um, initiative on open source science, um, or maybe it's a directive, I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, we then went on and heard from um, uh, folks that uh, use our mission data and um, and uh, um, and demonstrated how good architectures can help them do their science more more productively. Um, and then we uh, delved into some of the architectures. Um, we looked at uh, some of the we had presentations from uh, some of the NASA uh, core missions, the directed missions. So we heard from. Uh, several uh, of those um, that are currently either in development or in recent operations. Um, so it was a very productive day, it went on for five hours. Um, today we're going to be shortening the um, meeting down to four hours, so I think it's four, we'll be finished by four o'clock uh, Eastern time today. <clears throat> um, and we will continue the theme here of uh, Earth science uh, missions from both um, uh, NASA and non-NASA missions, so I'm um, looking forward to today's set of meetings. Um, before I start though, I have just a couple of announcements. Um, the first one is we are, yesterday we had Slido running. Uh, we just recognized that that got a bit confusing. We had some people typing in Slido, some people in chat. So today we're going to um, keep all the uh, comments in chat and questions in chat today. Um, and just looking at the number of people that are on on the um, on on the agenda here or in the audience, I know a lot of you are, are experts in science data processing systems. So I do want to encourage you to you know put your comments into the chat, right? Because we're we're monitoring that and we're capturing uh, what what you've got to say. And I'm sure there's going to be some nuggets from there that's going to help the uh, uh, the working group um, do their study. So. Something just comes to mind, right? When we when when somebody's talking, jot it down, get it into the uh, chat. We really do appreciate it. Um, the other um, the other announcement is, uh, please take a look at the the, uh, the chat here today from Andy Mitchell. Um, we do want everybody to remain respectful um, on on the um, to the course of this uh, discussions. Um, please do not share the uh, uh, links either. Um, um, and if uh, somebody is here that hasn't registered, please go ahead and, and register. Um, and my final other announcement is regarding the breakout rooms. I think they were quite successful yesterday, um, but I, I, I understand a few people lost um, audio or lost video and um, my, the microphone. Uh, that happened to me. And for me, I had to uh, reboot my, actually reboot my machine. I've heard that if you also just uh, like uh, log out, uh, re restart some of your apps, that also solve the problem as well. But we'll do, deal with that again when we get to the breakout rooms. Um, so with that, uh, I just want to quickly pass it over to our working group chairs, Elias and Natasha, to see if you've got any announcements you want to make. Hi everyone, I'm Elias Safi, co-lead for the Architecture Working Group. Just a quick announcement. Um, we were hoping to send a questionnaire along with the templates to all the folks that presented, uh, but we needed to get some approvals. That's been now complete, so please be on the lookout for that. 
this is sort of a, a lower level set of details that would enhance the presentations you've already made. And the folks that have yet to present, uh, you will also be getting this. So uh, please put a little bit of time and effort into filling that out for us. Uh, and then we can use that as a more uh, detailed input beyond what you've presented. So uh, please be on the lookout for that. Okay, thanks Elias. All right, so let's uh, kick off today's session. Um, first one, uh, Andy uh, Mitchell will be chairing that. Thank you, Andy, over to you. Thank you, Andy. So our first session focuses on mission processing architectures from NASA's Earth System Science Pathfinder Program. Uh, the goals of this program are to stimulate new scientific understanding of the global Earth system through the development and operation of remote sensing missions. So I'm very pleased to welcome our first speaker, Cecilia Ching from NASA's JPL. Uh, Cecilia is the manager for the OCO2 and OCO3 mission data processing system. I see you, Cecilia, and I think we're all- Hello. Just want to show my face and say hello, everyone. Uh, so, and then I will turn off my video and share screen. Oops. Perfect. Okay, all right. Um, good day, everyone. So I am currently the OCO3 uh, Deputy Project Manager and uh, the NISAR SDS uh, Manager, Science Data System Manager. Uh, I was the development lead on the OCO2 and OCO3 Science Data System. So that is our focus today. Um, we'll start off with an overview of the OCO2 and OCO3 system, and then we'll go into the details of the system architecture. We'll talk a little bit about our implementation approach, as well as take you down our memory lane, uh, a trip down our memory lane uh, to, to uh, go back all the way back to 2005. Uh, and then we'll conclude with the project's um, uh, support on open source science. So as mentioned, OCO2, Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, launched on July 2nd in 2014. And the objective is to measure uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. OCO3 was launched in 2019. And instead of being on its own satellite, uh, OCO3 is actually mounted on the International Space Station. Uh, to speak, we are mounted on GEM-EF, Japanese Experiment Module Exposed Facility Site Number 3. The OCO3 instrument is the exact same instrument on OCO2. In fact, it is the flight spare from the OCO2 mission. So this is just a brief slide on the science. Uh, it's a three band spectrometer. We measure A band strong CO2 and weak CO2 uh, with a precision of uh, demonstrating a precision of one part per million. Uh, the objective about, you know, uh, collecting for three years, that's applicable to OCO3. OCO2 has a, uh, is currently an extended mission and is going to go uh, a lot longer. Uh, in data collection, both OCO2 and OCO3 collect data in nadir, flint, and target modes. So nadir is just uh, the default mode looking over land during the daytime. In glint mode measurements are taken over water near the glint spot to mix, maximize the signal. And the target mapping mode uh, is uh, taking over a specific point. So on OCO2, uh, you can actually reorient the spacecraft to point to these different uh, locations and collect data in these three modes. Uh, on OCO3, we cannot reorient the space station. So OCO3 has a, a component. Uh, it's a two axle um, component called pointing mirror assembly, PMA, uh, that will allow us to collect data in these three modes. Uh, but in addition, because we have this PMA that allows us to um, point and have more flexibility on where you point, um, on OCO3, we have a fourth mode called area mapping mode. Uh, it is spec uh, targets a specific location and then slew to sweep across a region of 100 kilometer and uh, by 100 kilometer. Okay, this slide shows the uh, functional scope of our science data system. I want to stress uh, the importance that OCO2 and OCO3 are actually separate data systems. It's two different flight projects 
two different project codes, charge numbers, and two different instantiations of the uh, science data system. However, they are uh, all leverage off on the same core architecture. Um, the functions of the science data system include receiving and ingesting data, uh, instrument data, health and status data. We support algorithm development and validation. Uh, data processing, uh, we go from level zero to level two. Uh, in, on OCO2 and OCO3, we have both the nominal processing the monthly reprocessing and the bulk reprocessing. And I'll speak more about these three special types of processing uh, in subsequent slides. Uh, we are also responsible for storing and cataloging data products and sending the data to the DAC, the data archive. Uh, our DAC is the, at Goddard, it's the Just Disk. And um, the, uh, our ops team also provides uh, reports on data accountability and uh, performance and latency. Uh, the pink boxes are our external interfaces. So as I mentioned, OCO2 and OCO3 are on different um, platforms. So naturally, the data stream is different. So OCO2 telemetry comes from EDOS, and OCO3 telemetry comes from the HOSC at Huntsville Operations Support Center. Uh, the weather model comes from GMAO, and both projects use the same uh, same set of weather model data, the GS5 FPIT data. Uh, the DAC, and we use the same DAC. Uh, the data are in different collections, but we send it to the same DAC at the Just Disk. And the DAC is uh, our uh, uh, place for distributing and archiving the science data products. Uh, we do have a couple internal teams that we interface with. Um, calibration team over here, uh, same calibration team supports both projects. Uh, we receive calibration parameters and we make all our products available to them. On the mission operation side for OCO3, it's a local team you know, at JPL. On OCO2, we have a JPL MOS team and also a spacecraft ops team at uh, North Bremen. Okay, this is the slide where I'll be going into a little bit more about the different processing streams. So each project has four deployments of the data system and they are all managed by the ops team. So I'm not going into the dev or the int uh, environments, just the ops. The first one supports forward stream. Uh, you can think of it kind of like your near real time stream. Uh, we ingest the telemetry and process the, uh, the data as fast as we can. We select a small number of soundings, 6% only, uh, which then allows us to get results quickly and alerting us to any potential issues that might require immediate attention. Uh, so on the right here in the table is a summary of the data volume. Uh, you can see that OCO2, OCO3 uh, has pretty much the same, same uh, uh, data volume. On the OCO3 side is slightly higher because we do have two extra uh, cameras that send, send down data. So uh, that accounts for the additional um, telemetry. On the ancillary files, uh, the OCO2 actually queries the OCO3 database for the weather model files, so their ancillary files volume is very small. And then we have a separate data system for reprocessing. Um, this, the, in this reprocessing model or um, a strategy, we actually select all cloud-free scenes and it allows the selected um, percentage of soundings to be approximately 24%. Um, this gives us a larger data set and a better quality products, and this is the one that we ask our science community to use. Uh, the reason why we can uh, uh, um, support processing a higher number of uh, percentage of soundings is because we can leverage off uh, the resources at Pleiades and Amazon Web Services for the level two full physics processing. Uh, so. On a monthly basis, we reprocess all that month's data with updated calibration parameters. So this gives us the better quality products that we ask uh, the science community to use. And in the bulk reprocessing campaign, we reprocess all available data, all available mission data with updated algorithms and updated uh, calibration parameters. So I think this is a little bit uh, unique because uh, I don't think most projects to the monthly uh, reprocessing. The bulk reprocessing is common. And then we also have two, uh, 
two additional science data systems as uh, data systems for supporting science computing facility work. So you may ask why two SCFs? Why not just one? You have one for each. Um, so the ops team recommended this and it allows them to provide uh, flexibility and allow ease of use uh, control over resources. And in this SCF, uh, we we usually test with uh, updated algorithm, generate larger data sets, and we can um, uh, allow different configuration of workflow or PG, uh, the software uh, uh, configuration and, uh, and generate, you know, test data suite for the science team to check out. Um, this slide is on the compute. Uh, the numbers are a little dated um, back in 2015. I don't have the newest numbers, but the concept is the same. Uh, we have a dedicated resources. This is all on-prem uh, at JPL. Uh, this, uh, we have a, a dedicated OCO2 cluster and uh, ops um, servers just to support the forward stream. On OCO3, same thing. We have dedicated um, uh, servers for supporting the forward stream. The shared part is uh, the SCF and, uh, and uh, shared between the two projects. Okay, this is the slide on our system architecture. Um, we leverage off the PCS, the processing control system, uh, which is actually a the precursor of OODT. And I'll talk more about it at the next slide when we talk about implementation approach. Uh, the yellow boxes here are the crawlers, what we call the crawlers, and they are responsible for ingesting files, whether they are telemetry files, ancillary files, and so forth. Uh, they talk to the file manager. File manager is a server that talks to the database. Uh, database is an Oracle database in the back end. And we, the file manager can talk to multiple databases, and we can set up multiple file managers, and we can even uh, uh, talk to uh, another project's file manager. So in the case of uh, OCO2, as I mentioned, uh, they query, OCO2 queries the OCO3 file manager to get the GS5 FPIT files so that these uh, files do not need to be ingested twice. We can also set up this as a read only. And uh, if that turned out to be really useful because then we don't need to worry about someone uh, wanting to query the system and accidentally um, submitting a malformed uh, SQL query or you know some query that returns a large data set and takes down a whole operating system. The workflow manager in the pink uh, executes the workflows. It talks to the resource manager, which is assigning uh, responsible for assigning jobs to run on batch steps. The batch steps are little workers here that can be run on different uh, nodes and um, here you will see that you know the batch stuff. You can run it on the PBS local batch scheduler, or it can talk to the Pleiades, the the, the um, supercomputers at NASA Ames. It can also um, be launched on the uh, via high SDS um, at Amazon. Uh, the implementation approach OCO2 and OCO3 data system uh, was going to use the uh, is currently using the JPL. Section 398 developed object oriented data technology, the OODT, uh, which we call the PCS process control system. It is a JPL branch of the OODT data system, uh, and the OODT system was later, later on open sourced, but we stayed on the JPL branch. Uh, it, the other projects that use this code base is uh, JPL Sounder, Pete, and SIPS. Each project provides its own adaptations, including the workflows and PGs, et cetera. So we leverage off existing software and development team and the developers. We have ex uh, exactly the same team of developers on both OCO2 and OCO3. And uh, as I mentioned here, OCO3's implementation leverages off OCO2, OCO2 leverages off ACOS, ACOS leverages off OCO. And you might ask, what is OECOS and OCO? And that, that will be the next slide. So OCO is actually the first um, uh, project that NASA wanted to, uh, that, that has planned to collect the uh, uh, CO2 from atmosphere. Unfortunately, it was lost in the um, uh, orbit insertion failure back in 2009. Uh, in, in preparation for support of OCO, 
uh, we use the PCS, as I previously mentioned, which actually leverage off, uh, was going to leverage off the CAST uh, system that was supporting Kwiksat and Seawinds. However, um, back then, uh, the developer decided that, you know, it's probably better off to start from scratch. So just leveraging off the ideas and uh, lessons learned from the previous missions and started off the whole new branch that later on become ODT. And then comes ACOS. So soon um, after, after the loss of OCO in anticipation of OCO2, NASA funded the atmospheric CO2 observations from space, ACOS, to process JAXA's GOSAT missions data. Uh, the PCS system was adapted and it was used in ops from 2010 to 2014. Um, and the major thing here with this uh, the ACOS system was that we uh, set up a prototyping effort to use Pleiades as a computing resource. And this is how it allowed us to to the process the 24% uh, or all cloud-free scenes on both missions now. In OCO2, uh, it two minute was- warning, uh, Two minute warning, Cecilia. Two minute warning. Excuse me? Uh, two, okay, two more OC <laughs> OCO2 data system was rebranded uh, as OCO2. And in the OCO2 era, we this is the first use of the high SDS system. Uh, so at each point, we added something new um, so, and then on OCO3, we cloned the OCO2 data system and made the OCO3 adaptations. Um, since I don't have time, I'll just skip to the next slide. Uh, I want to stress a little bit on this because I think OCO2, OCO3 has a unique um, processing approach is that it's a hybrid. Uh, we use on-prem uh, Pleiades as well as AWS resources. And only the L2 FP job is farmed out, uh, the data system and the L0, L1, everything is on premise. So all the uh, green lines are the OCO2 reprocessing campaigns, the blue is OCO3. As you can see in the beginning, uh, it lie heavily on JPL resources as we gain more experience with using uh, Pleiades resources and AWS resources. Uh, OCO2 is now moving away from uh, relying on JPL resources, which is the blue. Uh, in fact, in the current reprocessing campaign, uh, they will only rely on Pleiades and AWS for the L2F reprocessing. OCO3 currently does not have uh, does not use resources at AWS, just because from a funding spec, uh, perspective. But we are considering it and to use it in our uh, final reprocessing campaign if we have uh, the resources. Uh, last slide is on open source science on the project's uh, support on open source science. The software uh, is on a JPL branch, but ODT core software is available publicly, and so is the L2 full physics algorithm. All the data is publicly available at JustDisk. Uh, we have what we call the light versions, which is just a daily file uh, of the L2 products. And various scientific groups take the data and estimate the carbon sources and sinks. All these estimates from the data are also publicly available. Um, XCO2 data can be viewed on NASA Worldview. And last year, Karen and, uh, and uh, a few other people ran an online RSAT course to use on how to use the SIF products. And this year, they will continue with that training to talk about how to use the Flux products. And this is my final slide. Thank you so much. Perfect timing. Um, there are some questions inside of chat, um, and I think some folks were uh, responding to them already. Uh, we do have one slight change to the agenda. There will be a question and answer period immediately following uh, this session. So instead of uh, running off to break, we will be able to have our, our Q&A. So we're just swapping that around. Uh, but our next speaker is Phil Broderick, from, also from JPL. Phil is research technologist working on NASA's EMIT mission science team. Hey, Phil, everything looks good. Excellent. Let's see if that's going. Uh, are you following me there? And can you hear me? We can hear you and we can see your slides. Perfect. Okay. Uh, well, then, uh, thanks so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to be presenting this. 
um, of course, on behalf of not only SDS, the SDS team, and in particular, Sarah Lynn Dean, our SDS manager, uh, but really on behalf of the entire team, uh, many of whom are furiously at work right now as we uh, close in towards our launch date, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Great, so uh, the uh, Earth Surface Mineral Dust Source Investigation, uh, or MIT, is an endeavor to constrain the sign and magnitude of dust-related radiative forcing uh, and to predict the increase or decrease of available dust sources under future climate scenarios. And the mechanism that we're going to use to do that is uh, surface mineralogical mapping via imaging spectroscopy. So this is really a first of its kind uh, uh, mission, uh, and it's going to use a state-of-the-art imaging spectrometer uh, and, and give us much more global extensive coverage than we've ever had from spectroscopy before. Uh, we launch uh, this year to the ISS. Nominally right now, our launch date uh, is uh, June 7th. Uh, and so we're ramping up to, to do that. Uh, I don't want to spend too much uh, on the instrument here today, but I couldn't help putting up a few pictures. Uh, everything is coming together. They're in their final thermal vacuum test, uh, I think even today. Um, this is an extraordinarily well calibrated spectrometer, uh, and we're really excited uh, to start uh, pulling down data from it all of it. Uh, so just a, a, a brief overview, and I'm going to do this uh, in, in a little bit more detail in PGEs as I talk through kind of the open source aspect uh, of the various pieces of code that we're using. But in brief, uh, effectively, uh, this is a push broom spectrometer, so it's actually thousands or tens of thousands of spectrometers operating together simultaneously to map uh, as it pushes across the Earth's surface down here in an RGB. And we feature match against uh, specific mineral absorption features in order to map out mineralogy and ultimately use that mineralogy within the context of Earth system models. So the detector would sit right here in this picture. Um, and it's, uh, like I mentioned, going to the ISS on a planned SpaceX 25 launch and is going to sit right here on the ISS. Uh, just an overview, and again, I'm going to jump into the PGEs in a second, uh, but our science data system uh, interfaces uh, with iOS, so we get data as well from the HOSP because uh, this is an ISS mission, um, and our output uh, of our data once we do all of our conversions into our final data products, which are going to be that CF4, um, those will go over to the land processing. Um, and the, uh, <clears throat> we have a secondary um, interface, uh, not just to the LPDAC, but also directly to our science team so that they can be working with us directly and utilizing a lot of the ancillary products that we don't necessarily deliver to the DAC, but can be used for, for uh, uh, validation and verification. And then finally, those, uh, uh, that team will take some of those products and run the Earth system models that I'll get to that in a second. All right, so just a visual overview of the different steps that go on. Our L1A step, um, this is just raw packet assembly. I have many folks here are very familiar with this. And then our L1B is uh, where the science kicks off and we start doing our instrument calibration as well as the uh, precise geolocation. Now, as I go through each one of these PGEs, I'm going to try to highlight uh, what the open source relevancy of each step. So the L1, or, or how general or extensible they are. So L1 is not particularly general. This is custom. It's specific to the type of hardware. Uh, you wouldn't imagine using this for, for another mission in the future. Uh, but the L1B instrument calibration phase is incredibly extensible. This applies to all sorts of uh, imaging spectrometers, uh, especially Dyson ones, but uh, other ones as well. Uh, and it's our, this code is already being used uh, by collaborators on other projects, including commercial projects. Uh, and the geolocation code is currently not extensible because it's underpinned by some not open source software, but that is being alleviated. So that software is in the process of being made open source and eventually will be extensible in the future. Uh, the next step, once we get to that calibrated uh, uh, radiance data, is to convert it to estimated surface reflectance. And this is a hugely computationally intensive step, and we've uh, pulled on a series of legacy code and done a bunch of adaptation to try to make this run efficiently enough on our system. But in this process, we take a calibrated radiance cube and turn it into surface estimated reflectance, uh, something like the top graph in radiance to the bottom graph in reflectance here. 
Uh, and we also do some cloud masking here and some uh, masking to make sure that we're uh, not uh, seeing some of the ISS or various other objects. So this code is uh, highly reusable. It's used by other projects now, including our airborne analogs. Uh, it, it might be used for things uh, like SPG in the future. That's to be determined. Uh, this is a native open source uh, project. So this existed before the emit mission, will exist afterwards. And what we've done uh, in the context of emit is uh, rather than change this or branch this even, we've worked directly in this project. This is made easier by the fact that the project maintainers are on this project as well. Um, but we've really worked to embed all of the efforts that we're doing straight into the ISOPIC repository. Uh, and this repository is now also uh, supported via the uh, uh, OS, uh, the open source uh, libraries, tools, and frameworks uh, call recently. And so that will be getting expanded as well. From there, we step into our mineral feature matching. And so this uh, code has been around for quite some time. And the goal here is to identify a particular mineral based on its spectral feature. Uh, using that calibrated uh, uh, and adjusted reflectance uh, data. And the goal here is to map out surface mineralogy. Uh, this code has been around for several decades. Uh, it's legacy code. Um, it is written in Fortran uh, by one of our science team members, and we've adapted it to run on our SDS. But one of our ongoing challenges right now is to uh, make it uh, more user friendly so that not only is it in the open domain, but that it's accessible uh, to a variety of users that might want to do their own uh, processing down the line or, or different or analogous processing. Lastly, our, well, second to last, our level three step, this is where everything comes together. So we merge together all of these different surface mineralogies uh, and different fractional cover estimates from these previous processing steps. Um, we put them uh, all onto a map, and then we aggregate them, like you see in the top right, to a grid that's more appropriate for a system model, so a half a degree in our case. Um, and this step as well is highly reusable. So uh, not only are the individual geolocation kind of components uh, and mosaicing and, uh, and ortho rectification products uh, already immediately useful to airborne analogs, um, uh, but there is also the uh, standalone uh, repository for spectral mixing. Now, this code has been around uh, for some uh, time, again, several decades, but it, the uh, core pieces have already have always been embedded natively into either proprietary uh, software systems uh, or uh, uh, done in such a way that they cannot uh, execute in standalone. So we wrote a separate, highly efficient, uh, flexible, different custom version for this, which is again uh, available uh, in, in the open source domain already uh, and is currently already being used in other projects. And lastly, our level four step, uh, this is the Earth system modeling uh, component. Uh, and this is mostly run by, almost entirely run by our collaborators uh, uh, that are part of our science team, either the GISS model or the CSM uh, community uh, Earth system model and, and are open source as well. Uh, but these kind of live outside of our SDS and will be executed uh, by our uh, co-eyes. All right, so stepping back, now that we've gone through all the PGEs, here's back to looking at the processing system as a whole, uh, L0 through L3. Again, that's what exists within our domain. Uh, lots of linkages between these different levels, uh, uh, as you might expect, particularly for a mission that's oriented at this kind of hypothesis-driven uh, answer at the end. There's some inherent interdependencies between these levels. These are all mapped out here. Uh, here's a quick summary of our uh, data products. So um, nominally, we uh, estimate that we will be producing something on the order of a terabyte a day. We are uh, highly throttled by the downlink capacity of the ISS. Uh, and so that is by far a limiting factor, or we could be producing about 100 times the state of volume uh, order of magnitude there only. Um, and so the total mission volume will uh, be in the range of 330 uh, terabytes of data. Obviously, that's that's plus or minus depending on the actual operating conditions that we experience. 
Um, and our emit uh, SDF storage capacity is uh, petabyte scale storage. So we have uh, ample margin for this and some other products that might be generated. Uh, this is all going to be run in the JPL imaging spectrometer computing facility. So we use this uh, also for airborne uh, mission processing right now. It's a 64 node compute cluster, uh, 40 cores each, 180 gigs of RAM. Uh, so this is a full HPC solution. Um, uh, it's, we've got a lot of storage and a lot of capacity there. Uh, and uh, yeah, not much more to say there other than that this is fully HPC. Um, a little bit into uh, the processing. So this is a pretty compute heavy um, processing workflow. Uh, nominally, we're expecting some 11,000 core hours burned per day. Most of that, the majority of which, probably two thirds, sits in the surface reflectance, the L2A step. Um, and we've done a lot of work to, to make that more efficient over time. Uh, but we have plenty of capacity and margin to do that within our system. So our resource, uh, our overall resource utilization, and this is in core only. So uh, if you think about memory or storage, the, the utilization factors look a lot better. That's what, that's what limits things here, uh, is something at 18%. Uh, the resource efficiency, again, that's CPU efficiency of the resource that we're using at any given time sits around 53%. That's mostly because there's a couple steps that aren't fully parallelized. Um, uh, but on the whole, the efficiency is not bad, uh, particularly when you, you consider the other uses of resources being consumed. And our compute margin sits at something like 65%. Um, and it's probably actually much better than that once you consider uh, inter-level parallelism that's not modeled in here. Uh, but suffice it to say that we can process everything through. We can process probably a full day's worth of data in about eight and a half hours, uh, which gives us some, some good margin and will help with our reprocessing steps. Two minute Here's warning. the overall. Say again. Two minute warning. Yeah. Here's the uh, uh, overall um, schedule. Uh, so we are preparing for in orbit checkout and our initial operations phase. Uh, then we'll go through about a year of routine operations, after which we'll do mission closeout, uh, reprocessing, and final data delivery to the back. Okay, just a couple quick notes on open source science. So to meet our requirements for this mission, all we had to do was deliver the software to the LV DAC during phase F, uh, basically in zipped up files. We found that uh, insufficient um, and we thought that was a big missed opportunity. So we're actively releasing our code uh, now. It's available uh, under this emit SDS GitHub organization name. You can find it there. Um, this code is already being used by collaborators, including commercial collaborators, uh, which is one of the reasons that we made a big push to try to get it out early. Uh, and we hope during the course of this mission to be able to use feedback from those collaborators and improve the overall workflow as we go. Uh, three tenants that we tried to, to work by here. One, anywhere possible, we extended native open source repositories that already existed. Um, these include several that we're using here uh, and was a big factor in a lot of our decisions. Two, anytime we had to write our own, uh, the goal was to make them as standalone as possible so that they weren't uh, uh, cripplingly attached to the SDS and other people could pull them apart and utilize them for their own needs. And the third, uh, anytime we had to use legacy code, um, the goal was to do as much as we can to adapt it and integrate it into the open source framework. Finally, a few quick challenges. Um, uh, this first one isn't really a challenge. Uh, I put it here because it's noted as a challenge by a lot of the community a lot of the time, and that is that uh, to facilitate active development while maintaining mission stability, this is readily done via releases and uh, branching, and we are actively doing that here, and that will allow us to take pull requests while we proceed during the mission. So this one should really have a strike through it. The second one is a real concern, right? Striking the balance between respecting legacy software and increasing modern ease of use or, or modern software languages. This is a balance, right? Uh, and we're working really hard to navigate that and bring our collaborators along, as well as keep everything uh, open and usable and accessible by the community. Uh, so this is where a lot of our effort is at right now, uh, now that things are, are ready to go uh, for launch. And with that, I will conclude, and I think we're gonna do questions a little bit later. Yes.
Thank you, Phil. Um, and actually, I would uh, urge you or recommend you to stick around also for our breakout sessions, because I think a lot of the topics that you have in there um, were also brought up yesterday uh, concerning some of the open source things. So thanks again. Great presentation. Our next speaker, uh, Jeff Walter from NASA's Langley Research Center. Jeff, Jeff is the Deputy Head and Data Systems Architecture and Engineering Lead at Atmospheric Science Data Center. Uh, Jeff, I saw you earlier. All right. Yep. Thanks, Andy. So let me uh, just, I'll just turn my, do you want briefly just to say hi, everybody? And then uh, <laughs> cut it good off. Good to see here. you. <laughs> yeah, good to see you too, Andy. It's been a long time. It has. So, uh, my, uh, my internet connection has been acting up a little bit, so I'm going to stop my video and share my screen here. Okay. Is that, uh, is that displaying? Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so like Andy said, I'm Jeff Walter at uh, NASA Langley uh, Research Center, uh, ASDC, and uh, I'll be talking about the the Maya uh, mission and, and the SDS. So Maya is a you know JPL uh, mission. It was um, uh, you know selected under EVI three uh, as a hosted payload, uh, but we partnered with them uh, you know due to our in our history uh, with the Miser project of running processing for them for the last twenty years. Uh, you know we have a relationship with the with the PI and that team out there. So we we are partnered with them to build the uh, the operational portion of the of the SDS. So. Uh, you know, so just a little bit about Maya. The primary science objective is to, uh, to assess the impacts of particulate uh, uh, matter or PM on adverse uh, health outcomes. Uh, Maya was selected. Uh, the idea is that it's a hosted payload. So um, for anybody that might not be familiar with what that means, is the idea is that the project builds the instrument and the science algorithms and the and the processing system. Uh, but then the actual uh, ground data system and the, the spacecraft, the, the host, are, are provided by a, a commercial entity. Um, and ESSP, the, the Earth System Science Pathfinder Program Office, they are responsible for uh, procuring the host kind of a separately from JPL. Uh, and Maya will, uh, you know, be in a, a polar sun synchronous orbit. The altitude is still a little bit uncertain at this point. Um, it, we're currently, it's currently in phase C uh, and launches delayed till at least 2024 due to issues with the host procurement there was a host uh, that was procured and you know the starting to work with them but uh, long story short uh, NASA was not happy with them uh, with uh, where they were at their CDR the, the host uh, had a separate has a separate CDR from the instrument so they canceled that contract so uh, there's still some uncertainty uh, about uh, about how, when and, and, and how this thing's going to launch there's some ideas and there's some work going on out there it's not completely unknown but uh, that's still in work. Uh, and there's just uh, my website. They have a nice website if you want to hear more about the, the mission itself. Um, but here's kind of a just sort of a little bit about uh, about what's going on uh, uh, or, or kind of the Maya flow here within the SDS. So uh, Maya science data processing combines a uh, chemical transport model uh, with uh, aerosol retrievals, AOD retrievals from the on-orbit instrument and then uh, also builds a geostatistical regression models that are derived from surface monitor data at the specific target locations and you know, correlate them with, uh, you know, with the AOD and near surface uh, PM concentrations uh, measured from the, uh, uh, from the surface monitor and then also from the, from the CTM. And then uh, at, the, at the end, they, uh, they produce uh, you know, daily uh, for, for each my target, I'll talk a little bit about the targets in a minute, uh, you know, spatio-temporally spatio -temporally gap filled PM maps for a variety of different PM types with total PM and, you know, maybe speciated like, you know, black carbon or, you know, things of, things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's within the end of the, S, the SDS scope, but also on the Maya science team are, there's a team of epidemiologists uh, who, uh, who they have access, you know, not, not through NASA, but they have access to, uh, uh, geocoded, uh, you know, birth, death, hospital records, and things like that, and they'll do epidemiological studies uh, uh, based on uh, based on that that information. Um, so again, Maya is a targeted instrument. You know, it does not a global mapper, and uh, the idea is that so the targets will fall into uh, one of these categories. So there are, uh, I think, a dozen or at the moment 10, 10 12 uh, primary target areas, uh, and those are the areas. 
where we have access to surface monitor data and also where somebody on the science team, some one of the epidemiologists ha has access to um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the health records that they need to do their epidemiological studies. And that's kind of how these things, uh, these were chosen. Um, the secondary target areas, uh, so for the primary target areas, the full suite of processing will be done all the way through the PM, you know, the, the, the level four PM products. Secondary target areas will be acquiring instrument data um, and processing sort of as much as we can. But for these target areas, there's no, there's no specific, uh, you know, access to surface monitor data or anything like that. So, you know, for some of these, we might go up through level one, V2, or there might, might even go up through aerosol retrieval on some of them with the potential, you know, the ideas that, you know, the potential that maybe down the line, there might be, uh, you know, access to, to, to other data, but the, but the minimum uh, for the mission is to, uh, is for 10 target areas. And I think they've built in uh, the ideas they want to have at least 12 uh, to, to give some, some wiggle room there. And this list can change and it has changed uh, actually a, a little bit in the run up uh, to this. So uh, for the SDS itself, uh, key and driving requirements, uh, you know, are again, to process data from level zero to level four, deliver all the level one through four products to the uh, ASDC DAC, uh, and generate the final pro uh, version of all data products uh, to the DAC using a consistent and traceable set of processing algorithms and configurations. So we have to keep track of that. And uh, the mission life is intended to be a minimum of, of three years. Uh, so we have to maintain the system um, for at least three years, uh, you know, following completion of IOC plus phase out. Uh, stakeholders, uh, the project and science team, uh, ESSP, the ASDC DAC, you know, because they'll be taking uh, the Maya products and, and then distributing them to users, the air quality and research applications communities. Um, you know, external constraints, of course, you know, IT security is, it's, uh, you know, it's just something we all have to deal with uh, nowadays that can uh, some kind, sometimes constrain certain solutions, and that's fine. Um, and then, you know, the mission is cost capped. So sometimes the funding available for labor and computational resources while the launch schedule is uncertain, can make budgeting a little tricky, um, you know, and it has, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're managing it. It's, it, it's okay. It's not a, I wouldn't say it's a crisis. It's just, uh, it's just an extra variable that gets thrown in there. Um, so for the Maya processing concept, uh, I just tried to lay out a couple things here that, that kind of drive uh, our thinking on how to set this up. So uh, as I mentioned, Maya observations are targeted, they're not global. So uh, the primary target areas uh, will go, you know, process level one through four. And again, I didn't list the PGEs uh, like some here, some have here. It gets a little complicated and there are other things I wanted to, to sort of go over. Um, secondary target areas, level one for all, possibly level two aerosol for select others. Uh, what may determine which ones get processed to level two aerosol is the avail actually the availability of, of funding. Level two aerosol is extremely computationally intensive and, uh, so it really will just depend on how much, uh, uh, you know, uh, re at the end of the day, by the time we get to launch and all that, how, how much resource we can afford. Uh, then there's CalVal target areas and then targets of opportunity can come up. So, so um, you know, th with Maya, there, there may be something, they have this scheduled list of targets that they, that, they'll, that they see, but, you know, there may be some event in the world, uh, you know, a major fire or a volcano or something like that. And if, if the spacecraft happens to overfly it, then they will uh, do a, a target of opportunity uh, observation there. So we have to be able to accommodate that uh, as well. Um, additionally, for level two through four, there's going to actually be two, uh, two streams of processing. There's sort of a quote first look because um, uh, the, the chemical transport model uh, and, and some of the GRM stuff will use forecast meteorology data. Uh, and then, you know, at the end of every month, we'll have the reanalysis. So there's going to be sort of two streams. Uh, of that uh, that has to take place. So, uh, and then we have to be able to accommodate target specific configurations. So, you know, we may need to execute uh, different combinations of PGEs uh, for each target, you know, as, as noted above. Um, and a given, a, any given PGE could actually have a, a target specific configuration as well. So it could have some, some site specific uh, ancillary data that you have to select, you know, based on that particular target. So there's a lot of variables in there. Um, and, and so that kind of drove us to, instead of trying to set up a data-driven system, you know, or we had to, we, we sort of thought about, okay, plan-driven versus data-driven or proactive versus reactive system, where a proactive is where you lay out an explicit plan 
and then you kind of go and retrieve what you need from a data point of view. That's sort of how I think of it. Whereas reactive is you set up your workflow sort of a priori, and then it just responds to in, incoming data. Um, but given the large number of variables in our chain, that kind of definition is difficult. So, you know, we took the plan driven approach and, uh, and we actually rely on explicit information from an instrument observation plan uh, and then also a master target list to construct a workflow graph on a daily basis. And I, I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, here's our overall uh, system uh, architecture uh, here. So you can see that um, on the right uh, is the, uh, the scope of the, of the data process, the SDS sort of workflow manager. So it's the usual things, you know, we generate uh, produ uh, production request, you know, generate the plans where that, that's where we encapsulate the production rule logic. We manage uh, algorithm configurations and versioning, execute those rules. Uh, and then uh, there is also some facility, uh, I'll show that a little bit more in a different uh, diagram, uh, to, for automated event triggers. Uh, so you can, it can be triggered automatically uh, or uh, an operator uh, can, can do it via UI. Um, and then you know, there's the data processing, you know, manage the execution of the algorithms, deliver products to the DAC, uh, manage the local cache, and then track uh, you know, data accountability production history, provenance, and performance metrics. Um, and then down here at the bottom, so there's a separate entity that runs outside the workflow manager uh, that it, it's kind of a standalone service developed uh, by JPL um, that actually goes out to these various surface monitor networks and retrieves the surface monitor data. And the idea is that this, it processes the, um, uh, the surface monitor data, delivers it to the DAC, uh, and then, and then the SDS, the, the PGEs that require that, you know, it just accesses it uh, just like any other product. Um, so, um, one of the things that we, one of the decisions we made with, with this, which is sort of, you know, convenient for us at the moment, because the, both the SDS and the DAC are, are both, you know, on site at ASTC, but I think it's a an extensible idea is that we use the DAC exclusively for data access. So we don't maintain separate interfaces to these external ancillary data providers. Um, and that kind of simplifies uh, the operations uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the SDS itself. So, so, and on the left here, you can see the, def the sort of various uh, um, uh, providers, uh, you know, folks that, you know, that we send, that we get external information from. So there's the host provider ground data system, um, a variety of external ancillary providers. We get data from GMAO, uh, JESDISC, and uh, Flambe at University of Maryland. Um, we get instrument observation plans, as I mentioned, from the instrument ops team at JPL. And then the SCF at JPL will send us any sort of uh, internally generated ancillary data. And then they also send us their container images uh, as well as uh, their source code. So, you know, they do the container build, they do the image build out there, push it to our, um, our image, our container registry internally but then also uh, do the code. So we could build it ourselves, but it, this is just how we decided to do it. Two more minutes, Jeff. Oh my gosh, okay, I'm, I'm way behind. Uh, so this is a workflow manager um, here. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is just the different components that have, we tried to make this as generic as possible, it relies on a graph database. Um, the idea here is that we have, um, we try to encapsulate most of the mission specific complexities in these two components here, with the idea being that these are as generic uh, as possible so that they can be repurposed uh, for other missions. Um, and again, here, this is just our, our component and infrastructure view um, where you see all these things are inside uh, the ASDC. We run on the, an open shift cluster. Um, you know, we have a internal container registry. Um, we use a back in a graph database as the back end for us. We have a, a message broker, uh, RabbitMQ, that passes messages between all the various components. And then we do this uh, at the moment on-prem uh, compute cluster. So technology, um, we have, uh, you know, again, the OpenShift platform, which is based on, you know, Kubernetes uh, container orchestration system. Um, you know, the idea is that this is, you know, portable uh, to the cloud. So everything is containerized and then we could move back. It's on-prem on at the moment, but we could run back and forth. Um, all the service uh, components are, uh, are coded in Python uh, and built with Docker. Um, again, we're using the uh, back end, a graph database on the back end to represent uh, the production flows. Um, you know, it's natural to represent that as kind of an acyclic, directed acyclic graph. And, you know, it has, you can capture current system state, but then also detailed production history 
uh, and provenance. So we found that it's kind of a convenient uh, way to do this, particularly uh, for workflows that that uh, aren't the same every single time and, and can have variations and differences. The graph it really lends itself nicely to that. GraphQL is this kind of a query API, JSON-based query API. Um, again, uh, RabbitMQ uh, for, for all the messaging between components and that, that works really well uh, too. Um, for the science algorithms and executables, uh, we're currently running those in OpenShift, but we're transitioning that to sort of a more traditional cluster environment uh, and we're building them using Singularity uh, instead of Docker uh, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, there's built-in support for traditional HPC, but seems to be a, another way that some people are going because the security model uh, with Singularity prevents uh, uh, privilege escalation, you know, if you build your Docker containers incorrectly. So we've done some preliminary testing with that, seems to work pretty well. Uh, CICD, currently we're using Ansible for build and deployment, but in the future we'll be moving to, to GitLab. Um, and some of the questions here, does the, do we use reuse legacy, legacy software? Um, no, but we have reused a few legacy design concepts, particularly around the notion of, a, of an algorithm or PGE uh, executable uh, configuration. Uh, it's now you know, YAML based and, and specifies the rules and the inputs and outputs. Um, open source software, all the tech uh, that the system is based on or, or that we use is based on mature open source platforms and libraries. Um, international standards, you know, we you know, YAML, JSON, AMQP, which is the messaging standard. And then of course, uh, all the containers are, are OCI uh, compliant. Uh, software and uh, software developed in open and collaborative environment. We, at the moment, we, the development environment is currently not open to the public and you know, with minimal staff resources and mission milestones, we haven't had the bandwidth to make that a priority, but it could be done in the future. Um, cybersecurity, we handle uh, uh, everything's in compliant. We have an, an ASDC IT security plan, so everything that runs at ASDC is in, falls under that and is compliant uh, with that. You know, we we communicate regularly with the Langley OCIO to make sure that we're we're in compliance. Um, at, with respect to efficiency, uh, service level components run an open shift and you, know, you can scale, you know, since Kubernetes you know, container orchestration, you can scale individual components up and down. Uh, the Rabbit and Neo4j run on VMs that are sized specifically and again, easy to scale up and down. Um, and we have a cache storage manager that makes sure we don't have endless disk space. Uh, and then there's a, a cluster resource manager uh, that ensures that the job scheduling and resource management uh, are handled. Um, and I hate environment to again. cut you off, yeah. Jeff. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. This ended up going longer than I thought. But uh, yes, that's fine. Uh, happy to answer any other any other questions there. Any yeah, I know it's a, a lot to ask in a 15-minute time span, um, but the study team uh, will be following up with a lot of the speakers um, to get more detailed information. And as was mentioned this morning, a survey uh, will be going out to collect um, some other details. But thanks, Jeff. I know. I know how detailed. Sorry, wrong. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is Jess Braun from the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Jess is the project manager of Tropics Mission Data Processing Center. Jess, I saw you this morning. Or there you are. Yep, there I am. Just getting to uh, share my screen. Perfect. And we can see it. Um, okay, fantastic. So uh, it's not the presentation mode, though. Ah, uh, yes. No, yeah, I haven't that yet. Hopefully, you can see that Perfect. now. There it is. Okay, fantastic. Um, so yes, my uh, my name is Jessica Brown. Um, I am the uh, Tropics uh, Data Processing Center uh, managed project manager, uh, and uh, I would like to note that. Uh, my colleagues, Zach Griffith and Kevin Herbcheck uh, are also attending this workshop and here. So um, I've invited them to, to come and help answer some of the more technical uh, aspects uh, of this talk. Uh, so a little bit of background on tropics. Um, the time result observation of precipitation structure and storm intensity with a constellation of small sats. Uh, so that is the tropics uh, acronym. Uh, and it consists of uh, six CubeSats uh, that are going to be launched in uh, three low earth orbital planes uh, later this year in 2022. Uh, UW-Madison, uh, we were chosen uh, by the tropics project to be the data processing center. And I'll go over a little bit more about exactly what those roles are. Um, 
And a separate Pathfinder uh, mission uh, was launched uh, from the seventh satellite that was considered kind of the qualifier, the, the test satellite uh, that was launched in June uh, last year. And so uh, the DPC is currently uh, processing uh, data from the Pathfinder uh, that is currently uh, processing data up in orbit right now. And a couple of images on the right uh, show the 205 uh, gigahertz channel of Hurricane Ida uh, right before it makes landfall uh, on the, the top uh, right. Uh, and then on the bottom uh, right uh, the next day uh, when it actually makes uh, landfall in uh, the southern part of the United States. Um, one of the interesting things about this uh, saddle, these CubeSats is um, it's a, they're radiometers with 12 different channels that focus on providing uh, temperature and water vapor profiles, uh, precipitation measurements, as well as ice measurements, uh, cloud ice measurements. And the interesting thing is this 205 gigahertz channel is one of a, a brand new channel. Uh, and so it uh, has a set, set highest, with it being kind of a high frequency, um, it's uh, very sensitive to scattering off of precipitation. And so we're able to really see some of these rain bands uh, that are shown uh, kind of off uh, to the east of the, the center of the eye. Um, and so this is kind of a, a great uh, new path for, for science uh, as we continue on. So the data processing center, again, we're located at UW-Madison. So what do we do and what are our, what are our goals and, and what are our responsibilities? Uh, so we ingest the level zero data uh, from the provider uh, which is Blue Canyon Technologies, and we create the level one and the level two products, including any uh, browser imagery, um, using algorithms from the Tropic Science Team members. So these science team members were specifically chosen for this project, and ultimately they are our end user in terms of who we would su we would support and what products do we run. We run everything that is delivered to us from uh, the specific Tropic Science Team. We deliver all the data to the uh, Justice for Archive, which is the identified uh, DAC. Um, and eventually, uh, the data will be available to the general public, uh, including the Pathfinder. Um, right now, uh, the Pathfinder data is uh, kind of set up and being looked at by some of the uh, identified early adopters. But eventually, all this data will be available to the general public via uh, the Justice DAC, um, as well as uh, some other public sources, such as uh, NASA Worldview. And finally, uh, we support the science team um, with access to data products uh, from different versions of their algorithms. We support in the development and validation of their algorithms um, through uh, our development server, uh, as well as some other tools uh, from our website, which I will go over briefly. Um, I did also want to note, um, I think it's been mentioned a few other missions, um, but uh, the Tropics is also considered a COSCAT mission. Um, and so uh, we, we are, you know, absolutely working it within uh, some limitations uh, as this uh, hopefully launches later this year. If anyone has been following uh, Astra as a launch provider, and we are hoping uh, to have success with them later this year. In terms of some of our, our processing aspects, um, you know, we, we follow kind of a lot of the, the same standards to other NASA missions in uh, following all file standards according to any of the ICDs. Um, because we are located on the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus, we follow all NASA and UW cybersecurity policies. Um, but the kind of the main core is that we really do develop and integrate um, all of our software in, in a team environment. And a lot of this in uh, team environment expertise uh, from our, our workforce to our infrastructure and software components have really, um, and again, this was something that was also mentioned, been leveraged from previous projects. Um, at the UW-Madison, uh, the Atmosphere SIPS is also hosted here. Uh, and so the Tropics DPC was able to leverage and look at what did the Atmosphere SIPS do right? What aspects do we think we could utilize from their system and, and implement our own uh, similar uh, infrastructure, similar software components. Uh, for example, uh, eventually our file delivery for the Tropics DPC will be moving to the new NASA standard of the SDTP because the Atmosphere SIPS had to develop that. We were able to actually then utilize and leverage that aspect and that allowed us for some cost savings and be able to uh, go ahead and, and focus on other aspects of the project. Uh, and also 
this was very good in terms of getting spun up and getting uh, our project ready because the expertise that we had from many of our uh, staff who also do some work for the atmosphere of SIPs uh, was key because they had all this knowledge and this experience of already working in a very similar structure and a very similar mindset in terms of responsibilities and things like um, the, the delivery. So the entire DPC processing system, and I do have some diagrams coming up, um, is uh, designed to work in Kubernetes. Um, and it's uh, you know, implemented uh, infrastructure as code. Um, we don't currently utilize any uh, external cloud processing. Uh, we don't use Amazon Web Services, for example. Um, but we do consider kind of a more of an internal and an on-premise on cloud, um, which you know, does allow us to develop and test um, as if we're you know, running in a cloud environment. Uh, but we do consider that our processing system is, you know, considered to be cloud ready as can be if, you know, we would just need to actually implement it into the cloud. Um, and again, uh, the entire processing system has been reused and adapted um, as we are a prime example, as we took many components and many uh, aspects of the, the processing system from the atmosphere SIPs and then used it in the development of the implementation uh, at, the, at the DPC. So this is a very uh, high level uh, processing overview that shows our ingest from Blue Canyon Technologies. Uh, we ingest and stage the data. Uh, we go through our level 0B, level one, level two processing, create the products uh, at the DPC uh, and then deliver the data to justice. Um, as I said, uh, the mission has not been completely uh, set up yet. We are still waiting for our six full constellation to be launched. So. Um, at, at the end, we will be having a mission volume of all seven CubeSats, approximately 50 terabytes. Uh, and just for reference, I did not put up numbers, um, but we do have the capability to uh, store petabytes. Uh, so we are definitely uh, set for our uh, storage. So some of the technology that we use, um, we uh, all of our storage and compute infrastructure run 64-bit uh, CentOS Linux and Linux Stream. Um, our main critical software components, um, about all of them are just open source software um, with the exception of Jira, but uh, we use uh, PostgreSQL for our database, um, HD Condor for our high performance computing or batch job manager. Uh, our storage system is set up with Ceph um, and I think some other uh, presenters have mentioned that they have also used RabbitMQ for messaging. Uh, we do keep everything in version control and Git and then again, um, I did mention uh, Kubernetes uh, for deployment as well as, as Docker. Uh, so this is a more detailed in, uh, infrastructure diagram. Um, and so we can see our, our DPC resources um, that are, are in green uh, where we uh, use the HD Condor uh, and Flow for our main uh, computing. And so Flow is our internal workforce force management system. And so it's a Python based environment uh, that will describe exactly how to execute uh, the science data algorithms and how to find any associated uh, input data that's necessary uh, that comes from uh, our Kubernetes uh, where we run the ingest delivery uh, and other uh, aspects of our processing at well. Um, and they're all connected with our Ceph storage cluster. And then uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we can see our DPC algorithm development server. And this is uh, where the science team members were, will uh, implement and test their algorithms uh, in uh, environments similar to what we actually run uh, on the full DPC cluster. And so the science team member will create uh, and build a test package. And I'll go a little bit more about uh, how we have that set up. And uh, they will include all compiled binaries, um, input data, driver scripts, and, and kind of a, a test case for us to compare with. And then they send us a delivery. Uh, we do not touch their code. Um, we will help them if they have questions. But ultimately, the algorithm themselves is completely of the science team. And so we are off hands uh, with the exception um, of, of running it. So for our delivery, um, we do provide uh, the science team with uh, a set of instructions on how to set up and structure their delivery to us. Uh, we do maintain a duplicate copy of every delivery. 
every single delivery that they will ever send throughout the entire mission. Um, and then ultimately per NASA archive uh, rules, we will deliver the final versions of the software and the products to uh, Justice for Archive. And one of the main things that uh, this duplicate copy and, and maintaining this delivery structure and uh, this method is it allows for uh, ease of reprocessing as well as comparisons of code between the different science team software versions. So for example, this is um, a chart showing um, algorithm dependencies. Uh, this is for the Tropics Level 2A software. And uh, this shows the relationship between all the, the different, uh, the product and all the software that was used to produce it. So the blue circles are the, the different products. Uh, the orange squares are any support software, as we can see, IDL um, and MATLAB and the specific version that was used. And then the green squares are the delivered science software. So this will tell us for this specific level 2A product, this, these are the exact deliveries that were used. And so this will allow us to identify each version of code used to create it, used to produce the output product. And then we're able to also pass this information back to the science team uh, as they're reviewing different versions of their products. Two minutes, Jess. Thank you. Uh, so for uh, just to, to close, I just wanted to uh, demonstrate some of the tools that we have developed for the science team. Uh, the first is this data availability website, and it will allow um, the science team member or eventually anyone in the general public to take a look to see what data is available. Uh, and uh, they will eventually, once we have more than one satellite, uh, be able to uh, separate it by the specific satellites, by years, as well as different algorithm versions. Uh, so this will um, allow for mainly the science team to be able to really see uh, what data is available, but also uh, once we eventually go uh, public to be able to see uh, what data is available uh, in more of a, a real-time operations aspect. And then uh, I did want to comment on our uh, DPC data viewer. Uh, and uh, this is a great tool that allows uh, users to search by either storm or by satellite. Uh, and the key with by storm is uh, because the tropics mission is, you know, one of the main focuses is tropical cyclones and we have several products. Uh, the science team can take a look uh, and search by a specific storm, and we'll provide each of the different granules that uh, come uh, within a kilometer of the of the storm. And we also have some of the uh, the tropical storm tracks, and while well, with the intensities uh, overlaid, um, and uh, we will give some general information about some of the different information in the files themselves. Uh, that will also include things uh, like quality flags as a way for science team members to have a quick look at their data uh, to decide, okay, you know, these are the data sets I want to download, and this is the information I want to look at um, a little bit more closely. And this is just uh, going to kind of a more highlight example of some of the, the options. So in summary, um, you know, one of the main things uh, with the Tropics DPC, we really have found uh, leveraging some past experience with, from the atmosphere SIPs uh, and, and resources has proven to be very effective at getting the DPC up and running, as well as in some aspects, you know, cost savings and cost effective methods. Um, our current requirements, again, are mainly to support the NASA funded science team uh, as our requirements of the project, including uh, the final delivery of all the code to, to the justice. And you know, one of the things we also do is try and make uh, the most for our, our science team members by creating any unique tools um, or incorporating past tools uh, so that they can more accurately analyze and improve their algorithms and improve their data for the public. And then uh, as the mission progresses, the data will be available uh, through the justice stack. Uh, they will be the official source of the data. And we do have plans for imagery uh, production uh, to send it to NASA Worldview. And eventually we, we might also do some additional uh, output for uh, simulation to NWP centers and or distribu distribution um, in AWIPS, uh, which is National Weather Services uh, tool that they use at, um, at the forecast centers. Uh, so I'll hold off for uh, any questions um, until the uh, QA session. Perfect. Thank you, Jess. Perfect timing. Um, and again, I, I 
hope you can stay on for the breakout sessions because there's a lot of good information in here that uh, spans well with uh, some of the topics that we've had uh, for later this afternoon. Thanks again. So our last speaker in this session is Scott Lufke from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Scott is a co-investigator and the lead of the Science Operations Center for the JEDI mission. Hey, Scott, I can see Hello. you yep. and I can hear you. Hello. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Well, great. I'm Scott Lefke uh, at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I am a co-I on the JEDI mission. Uh, and I am also the mission's lead geodesist. And I'm also a product development lead. So on JEDI, it's a small mission, limited resources. So we play different roles. Um, and then, uh, Terry Pennington is the lead uh, SOC engineer and uh, uh, also recognize the full Science Operations Center team. Okay, just a little bit quick about JEDI. JEDI is an Earth Ventures instrument. Uh, it's a high resolution, full waveform laser altimeter measuring Earth's forests and topography. It was deployed on the ISS Japanese experiment module on December uh, 2018 and completed commissioning by April 2019. The uh, JEDI's main goals are to advance the ability to characterize the effects of changing climate and land use on ecosystem structure and dynamics for carbon cycle uh, and for biodiversity. And JEDI successfully completed a two-year mission in 2021 and it's currently operating in its extended mission phase. Uh, JEDI is its sole observation is a full waveform uh, laser altimeter. So it has eight beams, uh, four coverage beams, four power beams. Uh, each of those beams has a 25 meter footprint in it uh, that gets put along track every 60 meters. So these are little images. You can think of these as little images of the vertical uh, intercepted surfaces within that 25 meter footprint. Over the course of a two year mission, JEDI collected uh, 10 billion surface, uh, surface footprints. Um, the other aspect of JEDI is its very high accuracy geolocation requirement, which is less than 10 meters from the ISS. That is um, proven to be quite difficult and is a major part of that. And the waveform processing are a major part of what we have to do, including lots of flexibility to deal with the changes that the ISS imposes and um, to deal with various issues with the supporting sensors. Um, so overall, the requirements are, this is just a simple representation of them. That is uh, to provide the mock and science operations planning information. So JEDI has a point and control mechanism and we optimize and we do a planning every week and we optimize the sampling on the earth uh, based on the current performance. So that means there's a feedback loop with the science data processing and the science planning system. Uh, we plan science operations to accommodate operational constraints and approve flight rules, et cetera. Again, all to optimize the earth sampling. Uh, we produce and validate, deliver science data products to NASA designated DACs, two DACs here, the uh, LP DAC and the ORNL DAC. We maintain the ability to reprocess all level one through four science data products while uh, working on a current version. Uh, this is just a schematic to show the layout of the JEDI SOC Science Operations Center. I'll put again an emphasis on the fact that there's a science data processing system, which is what you would normally think. We collect the data, we make the data products, we put them out to the DAC, but we also do prediction uh, we also do very high fidelity prediction of positioning, orientation of the instrument, um, and we, uh, we provide both the JEDI science office and the science planning system, the coverage and geophysical data information in those predictions to compute each, each day a science activity timeline and reference ground track, which is the targeting for JEDI, because again, JEDI has a pointing mechanism so we can optimize the sampling. So this is an important feedback that we have to recognize. So we're, we're one of the other things that the science data processing system has to do is create rapid products in order to do this uh, optimization. 
Okay. I, I spoke about this, uh, again, providing the rapid products. The level 1A and 1B products, I, I am the lead on those, and that is uh, the precise positioning and pointing for JEDI, uh, the pointing requirements at the few arc seconds. Uh, the positioning requirement is uh, we're, we're under 10 centimeters radial positioning of the instrument. Um, and then it contains the geolocation uh, of those waveform ranging points. And ultimately, because there's a lot moving around, a lot of thermal gradients, et cetera, a huge part of this work is a continuous calibration of timing, ranging, and pointing parameters. Level two through four products uh, work on top of the level one in sequential order until you get to level three, which are gridded products, 4A and 4B. So uh, the gridded products of level three, the higher level 4A and 4B products can be computed uh, commensurate, but the level one through two products uh, are, um, are consecutive. Okay, just to give you an idea, uh, you know, we, we some our level one and two products go to the LP DAC, the three and four products go to the ORNL um, LDAC. Uh, these are the, I won't go over the, the, I won't go over in any detail what the various products are, just to know that these are the list of products. Um, they, the algorithm sources from direct analysis of previous data of airborne simulator data. We have an airborne simulator for JEDI, it's called the Elvis. And, um, and so this is from direct analysis. These are supplied by the product leads. Again, for example, I am the 1A, 1B product lead. Uh, and so uh, there's, a, there's an ATBD covering each of the products that says to the SOC, how, the science data processing system, how those were implemented. And then each product lead was intimately involved in the verification of, of the implementation of, of those algorithms. Uh, this gives you an idea of the size of the different products, about 115 terabytes per year per version of the data. Uh, overall, this is a science. I'm now I'm, I'm not going to focus on the science planning system, other than that it's important to note that the data processing system has some real time uh, or near real time uh, requirements. The science data processing system is made up of, uh, it, it's run or managed by, the sci by a science data management system or SDMS, which has heritage from ISAT one and two, we've used on at Goddard for Grace Processing and several other projects. It handles the management distribution of jobs, workflow, scheduling and tracking. Pointing and uh, positioning and pointing determination system is developed uh, in support of many of NASA's radar altimeter satellites, but more particularly for uh, the host of NASA's planetary and Earth observing laser altimeter systems. Uh, and this, this uh, su subsequently relies on e external data and processing that we do to um, support other geodetic missions. Uh, and it's a considerable, uh, uh, these are huge, large legacy uh, modeling codes and data reduction codes. Um, and that includes uh, the atmospheric path delay and the waveform processing, and then finally the footprint geolocation. And then each one of the products, so these, are, these develop the foundational um, ancillary data that goes into the generation of the products. And these products are implemented as uh, product generation exec executives. Okay, and I think I covered most of this just to know that the details of, of the data processing, et cetera, are in, the data, are in the science data management plan, captured in that plan, and in the ATBDs, uh, which uh, are associated with each uh, science team member that is a product lead. Uh, we have a flexible processing system. Uh, the, there are many different data products and granules, of course. Uh, those data products uh, have uh, associated metadata uh, on the file name and also internally in the products so they can be properly identified. A uh, big thing is that we have, uh, and of course for everyone else, is that we have a uh, environment that we can produce rapid products, final products, and test products for verification and the ability to run multiple versions at one time as we catch up with a new version. So, 
it's very important to be able to keep those straight and to track those. Um, it's uh, because Jedi has very limited resources. Uh, we have it uh, a very simple implementation computationally. It's a host of uh, Linux. It's a, a Linux cluster or a host of Linux servers uh, attached to a large storage array uh, RAID. Um, and uh, we have planned for multiple tech refreshes as the mission goes on to uh, optimize our spending or the dollars we have. Uh, as I'll say later, that's proved to be difficult because our, one of our big tech refreshes now, which is three, uh, was not, you know, is now for the, the mission extension and not for the original planned two year mission and ordering hardware and getting hardware set up during this time has been, uh, has proven to be a challenge. Um, in terms of software overview, uh, we use what we call Goth software or Goddard off the shelf. That's SDMS, which is our management system. Uh, Geodyne is a precision orbit determination, geodetic parameter estimation software. It's a huge piece of software, a legacy code that takes care of all the geophysical modeling uh, and uh, pointing, ranging, timing, calibration, positioning, geolocation, et cetera. Uh, and then there's the atmospheric path delay code, uh, which is a module that was developed for multiple, uh, for ISAT 2 and for JEDI and, uh, and um, other missions that uh, will need path delay calculations. And then COTS, uh, this might seem very familiar. You know, we use Python and MATLAB for data analysis, validation, visualization, uh, modern Fortran and C. Okay, so uh, we have some very- uh, Minute warning, Scott. Thank you very much. We have some very computationally intensive uh, uh, activities going on and um, uh, uh, we take advantage of this Fortran and C. Uh, in the highly specialized um, data processing. Again, mostly with the Geodyne software and we use Perl and Java for the data management and process executives and for the SDMS. So open source science, how does your project embrace? All mission data are distributed to the DAX and are available to the public. The PGEs are developed from the ATVDs and ATVDs are available to the public. That doesn't sound so great, but again, this mission was uh, developed without that in mind. So what are the barriers that exist? Small mission, limited resources. Source code was not intended for standalone public accessibility, et cetera. But um, one of the big things, the low level products, and I touched on this, are based on these large scale modeling, data reduction and geodetic parameter estimation software. And that software does not lend itself very well uh, to open source. It's very large. It relies on highly trained and specialized satellite geodesists to properly utilize. So that's a difficult hurdle that we probably could get over, but would need to resolve. What resources? Yeah, well, funding and expertise. Um, so what are the pain points? This is all basically hardware purchasing, sysadmin, and maintenance. It's, all, it's mostly hardware related, especially as you move into a mission extension, uh, you... Um, and, and you've spread out your tech refreshes. Uh, so, um, and the other part is moving large volumes of data. In the case of JEDI, we move it around probably too much from, from the observatory to the mock to the SOC, to the PIs Institute for validation, to the DAX, et cetera. So what could be the solutions? Well, cloud-based computing has the potential to eliminate the pain points above because we don't have to manage those hardware resources. We don't have to purchase them, et cetera. And also we don't have to push the data around to multiple places. Uh, what would be nice is early mission adoption, of course, uh, which give, with proper resource allocation. But what would really be nice is, um, so many of us in JEDI are experts at, our, at the science and the science products and the algorithms to produce those. Um, what would be nice is to have uh, NASA would have available proven implementation design plans, tools, and expertise that each mission could, could use and not have to reinvent the wheel. So that's it. I'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Scott.
Uh, now we are turning over into our, our fishbowl discussion. Um, it's our Q and A period that our uh, Sog will lead. Um, so I don't know if Elias or Natasha. See Elias. Yep, I can uh, lead this portion. Natasha and I are going to sort of alternate doing the, the fishbowl sessions. Uh, for this one, we've got a lot of questions. So I would ask the panel members to that, that are that the questions are addressed to please uh, try to be brief and quick so we can get to all of those. I know we have 15 minutes. Uh, so first question, uh, let's start here with uh, Cecilia. Uh, your system was an example of multi-platform as you have both on-prem, Pleiades, AWS usage, you know, and you're maintaining sort of multiple software stacks. Uh, this question also came through our chat, uh, especially for the PGEs and maybe even thinking of the data system and the storage. Uh, are there some lessons learned that you can share here as far as having this mini modal system with many different platforms and softwares? Uh, any lessons learned, advantages, disadvantages? Can we get Cecilia added here, please? Uh, for time's sake, let's address uh, another question. We'll start with Phil here. Uh, there was a level four PGE that you had shown on yours uh, where it was outside of the data system. It's sort of model driven. Uh, what's the motivation for running that outside uh, of the SDS? Um, so this was kind of baked into the uh, mission from the start. Part of the rationale uh, is to spread it around for multiple different Earth system models. So rather than run a, a single instance, we're going to uh, run that both the CSM uh, and the GISS. Uh, and um, partly, uh, I guess I don't. I guess I don't entirely even know what the complete rationale is. It's it's been the way that we're doing it for so long. Um, but the I think that really the idea for the mission is that these data products, the outputs from L3, will be used in different Earth system models uh, for a long time to come, not just the two that we've specified to directly try to address our hypothesis. Um, so we really are trying to set this up in as general of a way as possible. That we sort of is widely utilized. It's probably not a direct answer to your question because uh, I can't remember what the answer is. Yeah. I think what you've said is historically and maybe funding wise, that's how it was distributed and done that way. Uh, although that could be an efficiency in combining those. Uh, if we sort of continue on that same path, uh, you know, next question is for uh, Jeff here. Uh, in in terms of the system that you showed, and this seems to be a running theme from what we, we saw from almost everybody. The system is running on-prem, uh, but there's, you know, everything is, the software is being built to be able to run in the cloud. Why have you not, or maybe the question is, have you considered running in AWS? Uh, we have, yes. Um, so the main, I think, what reason. Stops you? Uh, what stops us? Um, so the main reason, can you hear me? Uh, so the reason we didn't jump right to AWS is because, um, again, we do have a, a kind of a limited uh, uh, compute budget. Um, so, and and we're, there's still some dust settling on exactly what the computational requirements are going to be for um, uh, for the Maya uh, processing the PGEs, particularly the the like as I mentioned the level two aerosol, which is about over ninety percent of the compute requirement. Um, and I just didn't feel comfortable. We had some on-prem re resources that we were able to repurpose while we worked through some of these things. I didn't want to burn through uh, limited budget on cloud uh, uh, costs um, uh, while we were still, while there were still some uh, unknowns uh, in that realm. Um, you know, I wanted to kind of, you know, keep my matches dry as far as that goes. And now once the dust settles on that, you know, we may very well uh, move to the cloud rather than than buy additional hardware because, like I said, some of it's computationally intensive. I would prefer to do it in the cloud, but we just don't know what the budget looks like for it yet. Yeah, I think that's a running theme as well. Sort of the cost, less the cost uncertainty, but even knowing what that profiling may look like and planning for that. Uh, thank you for that. Next question sort of builds onto this, and this is addressed to you, Jeff. 
um, beyond the tropics project, you, you, you showed uh, that University of uh, Wisconsin there has an on-prem cloud instantiation. What sort of the, you know, what led the university to think that way and build an on-prem cloud versus just utilizing what's already there in commercial cloud, AWS, Google, Microsoft? I think a lot of it for the tropics uh, was really just uh, we had the processing at the atmosphere sift was so well established already and we had seen the success and uh, the other aspect is for being at UW uh, we do have some additional uh, overhead costs associated with it and with tropics uh, being a cost cap mission uh, it was one of those where this was at a step the the method that we use now and have been implemented as kind of a, a one system method um, kind of in a similar processing alongside the atmosphere SIPs uh, made it more logical uh, to just continue with this well-established method and flexibility uh, that we already had set up and already had a similar infrastructure already set up and designed um, at UW that we're able to uh, kind of leverage a lot a lot of that uh, and, and kind of incorporate one system instead of um, you know having a completely separate system set up through through the cloud. I see. It's essentially building on legacy thought, legacy hardware and infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, the specific question, though, was you showed an on-prem uh, cloud instantiation that is being built there. What was the motivation for building that? Do you know that? Oh, for, for the, the specific just kind of like our, the on our, our cloud. Ads, but yeah, the on-premise cloud. Um, I'm not sure if uh, any of my team members want to, to chime in or not uh, also see if they maybe just send me a little note. Um, yeah. But yeah, ultimately I'm, I think some of this also again came from the uh, initial development of just building upon that legacy. Um, and when we went through and designed for the proposal for uh, Tropics, um, you know, we were, we were looking at more, you know, because the the Tropics launch had gone through like quite a bit of delays, and even the the, the development, the funding had gone through quite a bit of delays. That we were more focused on the the hardware uh, aspect itself versus actually looking towards cloud computing. Um, and so our our focus was to just continue with the hardware model, um, and then also it gives us more of some flexibility um, with some of our uh, current existing interfaces. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it would be interesting to see that. It seems like there's a, a growing theme of growing the on-prem infrastructures or even thinking about it, but with this new wave of cloud and getting software ready. Uh, so that's kind of what we're asking, especially to help us yes. in terms of determining uh, some architectures and, and, and things that we want to recommend for the ESL mission. Let's go back to that question we had for Cecilia, and thank you for uh, joining us this time. Uh, let me go ahead and repeat it if we can't remember it. Uh, your system was an example of this sort of mini platforms, right? AWS, Pleiades, uh, and on-prem. Uh, so especially for the PGEs and the metadata cataloging, any lessons learned for having these three different, you know, platforms? Yeah. So uh, building on the building the PGE on Pleiades is uh, a little bit more challenging because it is a separate OS, different uh, system, and. Um, and but when we go to building it for uh, use in AWS with integration with uh, high SDS, then we were using Docker, so that was that made it you know a lot more easier. So that's definitely one lesson learned. Uh, at that time, Pleiades didn't provide anything like that. Um, I think they they were looking at using a Singularity at one point, but um, the schedule didn't align with what we needed, so uh, we just did it the you know port the software over there, build it, test it, you know, and so that's definitely a lesson learned. If you could um, make use of these, uh, you know, Docker, you know, whatever technology um, um, you have that you can build it and then just deploy it, uh, install it and, and run it as is, that will definitely save time. And the reason uh, why we have these three uh, venues is definitely cost driven. Um, <clears throat> 
we didn't have a big, you know, compute budget, like, uh, you know, Jeff was saying. Uh, so it's it's kind of the other way around, right? Amazon has all these resources, but we were always looking, okay, you know, this is our budget. Well, how much can we process with this budget? So it's a little bit uh, the other way. And so uh, Pleiades is free, um, but it's not unlimited resources. So it's just a balance of using, um, you know, the three venues to process our data. That's something very interesting that you said where, right, it seems like what we're hearing is that depending on the thing you're trying to run, it may be cost efficient to farm it out versus keep it in. Uh, yeah. and, and that's one of the reasons you, you've done this here, um, yeah. at least cost wise. There was a sort of some follow up questions that came through the chat as well for you, Cecilia. Uh, and you know, one of the questions was that actually came from Jeff here. What criteria did you use in terms of determining what goes to Pleiades versus you know, the, the cloud. Yeah, definitely the cost. In terms of distributing <laughs> jobs. Uh, distributing jobs, yeah. So so we we look at how much, you know, data we have, and then we kind of plan, okay, if we run it on-prem, how much can we process uh, in in a month? And then if we run it, um, then, then we split it, you know, so maybe on-prem is like 2X, and then, you know, on Pleiades, it's like 4X. And then on Amazon, that means, you know, we need to up it to like maybe 7X to, you know, to have, uh, to re to finish our reprocessing campaign in the uh, required amount of time. So definitely cost and schedule driven. I see. Uh, any lessons learned that, you know, in, in terms of the reprocessing, what's more ideal, uh, Pleiades or AWS, or is it simply just cost driven? Uh, what is more ideal? I think de definitely pros and cons with each system, right? You know, we we were the the first one, I think, to use the highest yes uh, reverse. I think we are the first flight mission that high SDS um, supported. So back then, maybe um, you know, uh, actually a, a lot of the experience supporting us was fed back to high high SDS development. So probably Hook would be a better person to ask about, you know, what input you know they got and, and beefed up the highest yes system uh, from an ops pr perspective um, um, I don't think uh, definitely pros and cons right like I said play this is free and their staff is very supportive on um, helping us you know deploy our system and check out um, the I would say one at one disadvantage if I must pick one is that Pleiades has this annual maintenance period where the system is um, shut down. And then, of course, you know, being government run, you know, sometimes if there's, you know, government shut down, it may impact, you know, the the availability of the resources. But, but in all in all, it worked out. You know, we we really needed um, both uh, Amazon and Pleiades to support our um, ops. I see. Yeah, there's obviously advantages and disadvantages to between the two systems, but it doesn't seem like uh, you noticed anything in terms of the PGEs that were different across those two. Um, no. I see. Okay, let's go down to a question for Scott here. Uh, you mentioned that uh, some of Jedi software uh, includes MATLAB, right? And obviously, that's a licensed product. Uh, was that also used in your PGE core processing, uh, no. the actual op system? No, uh, it, that it was early on in. Oops, I hopefully you can hear me. It looks like I'm frozen, but early on in the development, um, we used it uh, for some of the engineering work we were doing, particularly with uh, the attitude determination, positioning, those things uh, where uh, myself and a couple other engineers are very used to doing that. Other than that, it's it's um, that that's really the only reason why we were using it and for some visualization hopefully you heard me i was it was, my not screen was frozen so no we heard it all i think what you said is it wasn't used for production yeah you used it in in validation and other things um and maybe another follow-on question for you uh the, does the jedi sds uh, the, include level three plus uh data product generation Right now, right now, because of um, we, so early on in the mission, we experienced some significant issues with the Star Tracker system, which took a great amount of work uh, to overcome. So those, the level three products are done at the SOC. The 
the level four products were done at Maryland so we could stay on schedule. Um, but now the SOC, it, it, the original plan was have the SOC do that, but now the SOC is moving towards computing the level four products. I see. And I think that's similar to what Phil was saying as well. And I would ask you that same question. Was there a motivation for splitting that across versus having it all in one system? Oh, I, I mean, it was initially planned for Jedi to have it all in one system. Like I said, there was a uh, major unexpected um, blinding of the trackers. And so it really created uh, a major focus and redevelopment on how we attack the what we call the precision attitude determination. Uh, there were a few other issues that were um, that cropped up that we had to deal with. So in order to stay on schedule with the processing, we took on that extra load and that unforeseen issue at the SOC and that University of Maryland, they took on the 4A and 4B processing and delivery to the DAC. We're obviously out of that now with version two. And so the SOC is taking over the computation of the level four. I hope that was clear. I would say it was good it. teamwork. <laughs> yeah, I guess if, when you're looking at systems, right, you sort of think if you have things in multiple places, now you have think, two things to maintain and two sets of teams and interfaces, and that always complicates yeah. and makes things more expensive. And that, that was kind of the yeah. motivation for that question. It does complicate it. We had an interface with the uh, University of Maryland anyway for validation. So, you know, that was set up anyway. Um, and the level four products are obviously highly, are all dependent on the level one and two. So it was important to stay on track with the one and two. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. We're sort of, you know, trying to assess all of this and think about, uh, how this would help us to to think about the architectures we're looking at. Yeah. Um, I think if you have one a sort free, of other thing, it, I was just going to say, if you have a free flyer, it's a little bit easier to, maybe to plan. And, you know, you're, you're more, um, you know, you control your own destiny, right? Uh, on the ISS, we found you have to be really flexible, which I'm sure other people have found. So. All right. So one more question, and this isn't, necessarily address to anybody specific, but feel free to jump in uh, here. Uh, there's an observation that it seems like uh, the systems that you guys have generally presented here are built on previously developed in-house software, uh, whatever that is, right? It was like, well, we have some software here and we deployed it this way and we used it. And in a lot of cases, there was also some in-house uh, previous hardware infrastructure as well. Uh, the question is, how is that software maintained outside of the project? Obviously, you've shown it here within your projects thing, but what happens between this project and the next project? Is there a, some kind of funding that keeps that sustaining? Or how does that software continue to go from one to the other? I saw Phil shaking his head, so feel free. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. So to an extent, some of ours um, is... Uh, some of the software uh, that we developed is probably going to be fairly specific to individual PGEs, and I noted what some of those were, you know, packet reassembly and something like this. It's kind of a one-time thing, and that's going to be open source, but we're probably not going to maintain it after the life cycle of the mission because we won't need it. Other of these packages, this is why we really tried to emphasize going to uh, standalone and independent uh, repositories and building our code into those as much as possible. So, for example, the ISOFIT repository that does our L2A uh, corrections, uh, while some of our team members work on that uh, as well, it is independent of the emit mission. So we've adapted everything into that. That's supported um, by a Roses call, an E7 Roses call um, from last year, um, and might be picked up and be directly supported by other missions, right? Because it's a standalone software. There's no reason that it can't be supported directly by the next mission that needs to take control of it, or a commercial entity that wants to utilize it and um, make commits and make changes to it, right? This is, I think, the real value of going to open source is that you don't necessarily have to guarantee that it's maintained and supported for lifecycle, right? It's a community prerogative. If the community wants to utilize the resource, they commit the time, 
right, to utilize it for their particular projects and invest that into the overall project and everyone benefits. Thank you for that. I know we are out of time and we're in the break uh, stage, so we'll have to hold off this discussion. But yeah, thank you for, for the inputs here. Uh, break time. Thanks, Elias. <clears throat> thank you. And thank you very much to the speakers. Um, that was fantastic. Um, thank you. Um, so we're going to take a 10-minute ten, ten break now. Um, we did allow that, um, that Q&A to go on an extra five minutes. So we will take five minutes away from the next Q&A. But I think that's going to be OK. Um, so let's return back at, uh, um, well, 11, 11.01 uh, Pacific time. Thank you. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, so we're going to start session four. But before we do that, I'd like to just pass it over to uh, Natasha. I think she has a short announcement to make. Sure, thanks. Um, thanks, Andy. Am I using the right? There we go, the right camera. Um, so I think Sarah's already put it in the uh, chat and we'll periodically repost this to make sure people have access to it. Um, but we are collecting input. So if you are nervous that maybe I put it in the chat and they didn't see it, um, we have a survey um, that asks a lot of the same kind of questions that you've been hearing from the SAWG and is an open template for you to be able to provide your thoughts about all of these topics. So um, please feel free to go in there at any point um, and provide your thoughts. Thanks, Natasha. <clears throat> so I believe that uh, that that template asks for specific questions and then they, you know then at the end there's a uh, uh, the option to just provide general comments as well so that's, that's great thank you um, okay so now we're going to move into session four um, this is uh, we're going to continue looking at the um, uh, earth system uh, earth missions um, but now we're going to have a, a look at non non uh, NASA missions. So we will be looking at um, agencies in the US and uh, and uh, our international partners. Um, we're having to because of the different time zones where we're obviously having to do things are slightly different. Um, so uh, what we'll be doing here is we'll have a couple couple presentations from the, um, from the US um, agencies. We will then stop, we'll have a short Q&A, then we'll stop and go into um, the breakout rooms. And then we'll return for a 15 minute presentation from JAXA. Um, it's early in the morning for them. Um, so we, leave, we left it to the end of the day uh, on our time to allow them to wake up. And then we'll break um, for the day and then return tomorrow and start hearing some of the, some of the uh, European um, um, speaks, uh, talks. Okay, so, um, so first I'd like to introduce uh, Joe Manny, who is from NOAA. Uh, Joe is a cloud architect, um, an IT specialist, um, working in the, um, the Assistant Chief Information Office um, over at NOAA. Um, and first, Joe, I just want to uh, congratulate you and your team on the recent um, GOES team launch. Um, so congratulations on that. Over to you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a point of order. I have a hard stop up at 3 p.m. Um, so if I'll stick around as long as I can, but at three, I'll have to, I'll have to drop off. Um, and uh, let me start sharing my screen. Please let me know when you're able to see my slides. Okay, we can see them. If you, if you could just put them into presentation mode. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me. My name is Joseph Mani. I work for NESDIS out of the um, Assistant Chief Information Officer for Satellites Shop. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what we've done in the cloud, um, some of our architecture, and the views I have for the architecture are mostly eye candy, but it's more important you listen to what I have to say. Um, but we can ask questions on anything I've said or some of the drawings you see, but they're not made for you to really, really dig down deep into. If you need something like that, I can always um, get it to you some other, meth other method with a more clear picture. 
Um, let's keep going. So NESDIS has some strategic objectives. Um, we want to be a leader, a leader position in geostationary and extended orbit observations, um, weather, space weather. We want LEO, we run LEO and geo spacecraft, as you mentioned last night or you know, afternoon, GOES-T launched. And in a few months, our controllers out of Super Maryland will take over and start managing that spacecraft through its life cycle. Um, we wanna make a agile, scalable ground capability. Um, so some of the problems we've had in the past, um, I'll talk about that. I'll talk about how we're getting this data, how we're gonna get it out to the public and how we're using the cloud to support all of this. So the NESDIS Ground Enterprise, the NGE, um, it's a bunch of different systems. So what was typically happening in the way we traditionally do things, and with each spacecraft launch, we have a complete end-to-end -end ground system that is ingest of the satellite data all the way through processing and distribution. And each satellite came with its own ground system. Uh, uh, goes RST, all use the same ground system, but it is its own system. The POSE satellites, they all have their own system. Nothing was communicating with each other freely. Um, so it's really unsustainable, that that model. Uh, so we had to come up with something different. And uh, not only do we have to change the architecture, we had to change our business to accept this. And as the commercial industries come forward with many, many products, we have a, we don't have an easy way to ingest those or to take those or to modify these existing systems to take on that data. Even though they're from the same class of spacecraft or same type of instrument, we just don't have the method to get it into the systems to process it. So these were the types of stovepipe problems. And then there's the data volumes. Um, each next, genera next generation spacecraft comes with an increasing data volume. How do we handle all of that? Um, and our on-prem on systems just weren't keeping up with the pace. And we also have the FISMA problem, the IT security. How do we manage these systems that don't like um, rapid change? How do we manage all those things? Um, so we came up with something called the NCCF, the NESDIS Common Cloud Framework. Um, we're looking at a common enterprise approach that's agnostic to the type of satellite. So no longer is it, uh, this is this is a NCCF for a POSE satellite or an NCCF for a GOES satellite. It is a data processing system that's at its core. Um, it's secure. Uh, we use Fed, uh, FedRAMP moderate cloud services. Um, it's FISMA compliant, so they're ATO'd. Um, we design with best practices, so it's highly available by design, not, not through requirements, but that's just the way it should be to make sure you can survive these outages. Um, it's scalable. Uh, if you need more capacity, you just push a button and more capacity appears. Um, we had to carefully orchestrate the software so that it could use that capacity. Um, data agnostic, so it doesn't care if it's a GOES imager, it doesn't care if it's a um, any anything that's ones and zeros it can basically process. If you in one day in one day in the future, if we wanted to process um, PDF files, we could. Um, it's decoupled. Um, each service can be independently upgraded or swapped out if we see a need for that. If it's not scaling properly, or if we have something new that the CSPs have delivered. Um, one of the most difficult things we're keeping up, uh, we're having is keeping up with the CSPs changes. They put out new products all the time. And sometimes if you have layered three, four, five different services together, chain them together to do something, and the CSP in their yearly rollout, they come up with something that supersedes everything you've done, you have to be able to adopt to that, ad adapt to that and take on those new services. That's what we wanted to. Uh, try to get to. Um, it's cloud agnostic. Uh, these workloads can run in any CSP, but that's a, there's an asterisk there. What does that mean? Um, we chose services that existed across the major CSPs. And when I say majors, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Um, so for example, if we used storage, it would be object storage. All three have that. Uh, we wanted to use containers. Um, and we are doing that. All three can support containers. Well, we use messaging queues. All three can support messaging queues. So that's when I say it's agnostic in that sense. It can be done. You have to make a conscious decision to migrate from one to the other. And it's not that we couldn't orchestrate something across the three. Um, our really hard part is the data. The data is only sitting in one CSP right now. If you really wanted it truly multi-cloud, poly-cloud operational, you'd have to have the data triplicated or duplicated however many ways you wanna pull it. Um, otherwise you'd be paying for egress costs if you egressed it from one cloud to the other two or three. However, however that works, but that's what we're finding. We have about 20 petabytes online right now inside of Amazon. Uh, that grows for about three petabytes a year. Um, and we have organized our workflows and our systems so that they use just enough capacity and 
no more than what we what we actually need. We don't go over um, unless there's a problem where we have to catch up. We have the capability to scale and burst, um, but that's the, the the nature of the cloud. Um, some of the services we're offering consolidated ingest. As files come in, they go into what we call the dirty bucket, and they're not allowed to be processed through the system until we do some checks. Um, initial checks are dependent upon the source. If we have a partnership with another organization and they're highly um, trusted, we don't put it through all of the checks. And some of the, uh, just sampling the checks would be, is it the file you said it was? If I said it was a JPEG image, is it actually a JPEG? Does it conform? Um, does it have the right metadata? Maybe there's a hash, can we check the hash? Antivirus is a given. Um, those are some of the things we check for. Um, we, we offer a storage service, um, that's an object storage. Um, and like I mentioned, how much we have online and that continues to grow. We have a metadata catalog. We just finished up in, um, a proof of concept using the NASA CMR um, between NASA and NOAA. So we have that potentially coming up as our metadata solution. Um, we have a flexible compute environment. Um, it's HPC based, what does that mean? Do we have any parallel software? No, but we use a top level scheduler that will assign jobs to available resources. So it's high performance in that sense that we use a top level scheduler and we have many, many worker nodes that can be called upon when there's a load. Um, we have a science and operations, uh, we have a separate science development and an ops environment. So our scientists have workstations in the cloud sitting right next to the data. They're pre-configured with the algorithms they need, the packages, the libraries, and they're able to log in and use that system in the cloud right next to the data. Um, we use CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipelines for our software. Uh, that's not as robust or as mature as we'd like it. That's still a work in progress. But eventually it will be, you test it in dev, we have an automated process with approvals through JIRA, that's our ticketing system and our um, safe agile system, software that we use. It'll let you approve it and you roll it through from dev to test to prod. That's what we're aiming for. Right now we're not there. Um, and distribution and access. We are still trying to support the legacy users. Um, and when I say legacy, the protocols, SFTP, FTPS, we'd like to push everybody towards HTTPS um, data transfers. And today we will send you the file or you can come and get the file. In the future, we'd like all customers to come and get the files from us via HTTPS. That's what we're shooting for. We also have another mechanism called the BDP, the Big Data Program, where we make certain data sets available free of charge to the public. And that comes out of um, multiple clouds, Amazon, Google, or Azure. Um, they can download those particular data sets and work with them. And the negotiations we have with the CSPs, if we do that, the CSPs are allowed to monetize and commercialize that product, but they have to give it away for free. Um, any value add, they're able to charge for it. So at the left side, you'll see all the types of sensors and satellites. It comes in through the ingest and you'll see how it's um, block diagram. We do the metadata storage, it's all integrated. And then we try to dis distribute it. Um, we still have on-premise systems and they're being migrated to the cloud. Um, what we tried not to do is a lift and shift unless absolutely necessary. We take each workload, assess it. Um, typically we containerize the algorithm processing. Um, some things can't be done yet and we're working on improving that so that we can leverage all of the managed services. So when I say some things can't be done, if you have a very high performance file server, we may have to do a lift and shift until we can work out and optimize the software to use Amazon's managed services. And I keep saying Amazon, that's where we've begun. We began our workloads in Amazon and we're there right now. We have a large presence in Amazon. And as I mentioned, it'll be a conscious decision to turn up another CSP. Right now, we are highly available across the CSP environment. We have multiple availability zones um, within one region. Uh, we're going to move to multi-region so that we can survive a collapse of a single region. Um, that's in process right now. We have multiple accounts, and each account is a separate environment. That's how we limit the damage something could uh, do in an environment, away script or runaway a virus in one environment, it won't creep over and affect another environment. So that's how we've chosen to do that is by accounts. Um, and we have a dev environment, ops environment, test environment, but we're only keeping one copy of the data. We try not to duplicate the data because that just drives up the cost. Um, and we leverage everything that the CSP has to offer, um, savings plans, um, 
reserved instances. These are all terms that Amazon uses. Um, spot instances. Amazon has a fleet, has a fleet of servers that's enormous, and they have excess capacity, and you can buy those at a very discounted rate. So we use some of those spot instances for batch reprocessing campaigns. Um, one of those is what we've done recently. We have a COVID-19 uh, reprocessing campaign. We took some of the data, reprocessed it, um, some of the aerosols, and then sent it back out. Um, but that was done on the cheap, uh, meaning you know, a few thousand dollars here and there. And we leveraged that Amazon infrastructure that's uh, excess capacity. Um, Again, this infrastructure view, as I mentioned, it's not easily readable, but if you'd like something more, we can we can do that for you. Um, this just shows you all of the tools we're using. So we are using managed services. We are using Kubernetes. We are using object storage, managed databases. Um, instead of rolling our own, we try to use everything that they offer that can suit our need. It's not that we don't, we can't roll our own. We just find it easier um, for our operations teams to leverage those managed services. It's just one less thing to worry about. Um, SQS, simple queuing service, SNS, simple no, uh, notification service, ex expandable file system. We have all these tools at our disposal. We use the right tool for the job. Um, we used a, we have, I mentioned multiple availability zones, multiple VPCs, virtual private clouds. Um, it's all about isolation of workloads to make sure one doesn't interfere with the other, FISMA compliance. These are all the tools we've leveraged. And right now we can process multiple satellites simultaneously. And now we don't have to worry about a new satellite or a new data source shows up. We can ingest it and we can accept that workload and do the processing. Um, this was a goal from when I started, probably about 12 years ago, trying to get to this point. We tried it on-prem, didn't work so well. Now the cloud is there. We're absolutely 100% moving towards this cloud um, configuration. And as the CSPs improve their tool sets, we migrate to those tool sets to make the processing more efficient and cheaper. Um, it's always about managing performance with cost in the cloud environments. Um, it's based on a multi account. I mentioned that. And we did everything automated. So we have infrastructure as code. All of our teams write the code, deploy via the code, and we tear down via that same code. We don't let anybody do hand tweaking of any of these infrastructure pieces. It all has to be done through um, automation. And we leverage the Amazon's automation tools there. It's called um, Cloud Forms. And we use that extensively to deploy our systems. Um, so it's primarily, it's almost exclusively Linux. Um, we try to use open source compilers, Python, Unidata libraries. Um, there's still arguments between our developers and scientists about open source compilers versus the Intel compilers. Um, there's, it, yes, it's a very, it's a, it's a heated battle there. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into that. And we talk about the licensing cost versus the performance. So we try to use as much open source as we can. And we try to um, make our code available um, when, when ready. We just don't like to put it out there. Um, we have many other things we're doing going forward um, is trying to use AIML. Um, we have a project going on with Google right now for data simulation and post-processing of the GFS model. Um, and all that code is going to be delivered uh, to the public. It's part of our agreement with them. One of the biggest problems we're seeing is how do we get external collaborators into the environment? NOAA has a requirement that we have to be uh, CAC enabled and we can't issue CACs to some of these folks. So that's one of the challenges we're trying to overcome. How do we get the non-CAC holders, non-NOAA employees um, into the system to collaborate? Um, Two minutes, we have um, something called the... Thank you. Cloud infrastructure. Cloud infra Got it. Right. Um, we have an infrastructure sandbox service that we use for R&D and development. Um, we have our NCEI group is piloting a program for archive. Um, they're supposed to be archiving the entire uh, NESDIS and NCEI and potentially NOAA's holdings. And they're working on a process, um, serverless, cloud-based, and it's all driven by managed services. Um, we have an IPT going to see how we're going to distribute our data out to the public. Um, we're working with Amazon directly for a consolidated um, discounted egress plan. Um, again, the problems are not unique. Enterprise management, who's running what? How do we uh, conform to IT security, access restrictions, um, understanding what metadata is requirement. 
networks required, um, data dissemination and discovery strategy, strategies. There's different users and different levels of comfort. Um, what do we support in the future? Um, and leveraging um, all of the tools all the time is difficult. And as new tools come on, we want to make sure we capture those. And moving all these tools into the cloud, we decided to move to a separate FISMA boundary just for all, all of our cloud tools, processes. And that took a bit of work. Um, and we're always looking for opportunities with our non-NOAA partners. I said a lot and I am finished. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, it's great to see how you guys are moving forward. Um, so I appreciate that. And um, we'll do a Q&A after the next uh, next session. So thank you, if you stick around. Um, so our next speaker is from the USGS. Um, we have Chris uh, Engelbertson, from, um, who's the Landsat um, Data System Processing Manager. Um, and Chris is also serving on the System Architecture Working Group for us. So thanks, Chris. Thanks, Andy. Let me, can you hear me all right? We can indeed. All right. Okay, can you see the slides all right? Yep, it's going to presentation mode and will be great, thank you. Okay, all right, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Landsat program and what we're doing um, as far as our mission data processing system and our eventual migration uh, into the cloud and talk about some of the activities that we've got going on and some of the challenges that, that we're facing. So I think most people are, are, are familiar with the Landsat program. The Landsat user base is very large and diverse. The, the true asset of, of Landsat data is the archive. It provides global coverage currently on a, on a 16 day basis, but, but it reaches back to 1972 and it's freely available, making it um, invaluable for a wide number of, of applications, particularly long scale temporal time series analyses. Um, our key and driving requirements is we, we have to uh, make available in an open and non-discriminatory uh, fashion all data um, to the public. And so that's our level one scenes, our level two scenes, our analysis ready data tiles, and then the level three products that are, that are generated from those ARD tiles. And we have a latency requirement of 24 hours for our level one and our level two scenes. The level two requirement is, is sort of a future requirement. Um, currently we have a reliance on um, external auxiliary data for atmospheric data to do level two processing. So we're, we're working on ways to, to reduce that, but, but our level one requirement is, is 24 hours. Our constraining factors as we move into the cloud, and, and you'll, you'll hear more about this in a couple of minutes, is, is our cloud costs, particularly as they pertain to product storage. One of the things that we found and one of the lessons that we've learned is that your processing costs tend to dwarf or be dwarfed by your, your long-term product storage costs. So one of the, the, the main drivers that's pushing us into the, into the cloud is this idea of large-scale processing. Since 2015, Landsat products have been pr produced as part of collections. We adopted sort of the MODIS approach to collections. Prior to 2015, we did more of our processing, most of our processing in an on-demand uh, fashion where we would generate products based on whatever the latest and greatest cal calibration parameters were available at the time. But since 2015 and since we adopted the collection philosophy, we've been ensuring this consistent formatting metadata calibration and, and geometric registration report, uh, approach. And this is critical to be consistent for things like some of these long-term uh, time series analyses. So when we did collection one processing, we did that in, we started in 2015 and that effort took us about 18 months to complete. And that processing was, was performed entirely on premises at the USGS Aero Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So for collection two, one of the things we wanted to do was make sure that we didn't trickle the data out. We wanted to generate it all at once and release it all at once. So we developed this large scale processing capability in AWS through the cloud um, contract that the USGS has. And so the result of that was collection two was, was performed in the fall of 2020 and it took just over a month to complete, even though the, the size of the archive had grown and we added a new global level two product um, collection one was only level one products. So we, even though we more than doubled the size of the input set, we went from 18 months down to about one month. 
And we actually could have done it probably in about half that time, but we kind of slow rolled the processing just to allow us to do a little bit of QA on, on some of the initial products. Um, and we recently completed the processing of collection two level three products in that same environment in a roughly about the same amount of time, um, about one month for about four and a half million products. So right now we're currently planning the roadmap for the migration of the remainder of our, our processing capabilities, which are, are primarily our forward processing strings on premises into the Landsat cloud. So what you're going to see in the next couple of slides is our future, our, our sort of our 2B planned architecture. Um, so at a very high level, um, you can see on the left, the Landsat has a network of ground stations, and then we've got our mock that's out at, uh, out at Goddard. Those are obviously outside of the cloud. But once we get mission data down to the ground, it gets routed directly into the, into the cloud. And aside from some user portal functionality that interfaces with the mock, the rest of the processing is going to be completely cloud-based um, in AWS. So that's everything from ingest processing through um, level zero, level one, level two processing, including CalVal, inventory metrics, and things like that. We'll still have our interfaces for our external, our, our external auxiliary data sets, um, and then we've got a public bucket for users to interact with the data, which I'll talk about here shortly. So just to drill down on this a little bit, um, this kind of talks about how the system's put together and some of the technologies that we're using. And I'll get into a little bit more details on the next slide, but once we get mission data down from the, the ground, we push it into the AWS environment, which is our Oregon uh, US West region. Um, it gets pushed into S3 buckets. Then we use uh, Lambda functions to do sort of this, this event-driven serverless um, process initiation. Um, we use SQS simple queuing services to uh, develop a uh, level zero interval queue. We ingest the data. Um, we've got a product order queue that we then push into our level one, level two processing systems. Um, throughout the entire process, we gather characterization data and trending data um, as we generate those products. Uh, we generate metadata. Um, and then once those products are generated, they get pushed out into an intermediate S3 bucket, then get pushed out into a public S3 bucket, at which point they're visible to, to the general public. And then we publish all the details in our searchable inventory um, database, um, at which point that data becomes visible in all of our standard search and discovery interfaces to the public. So if you're familiar with those, that would be like Earth Explorer, machine to machine, things like that. So at that point, the data is available either for direct um, uh, access in the cloud, which we're seeing a lot more um, uptake among our user community of, of doing direct cloud access, or the more traditional download um, mechanism where you can download a tarball to your own, um, um, your own facilities on premises. We, we want to make sure that we support both of those capabilities because we don't expect everybody to move into the cloud immediately. So it's important for us to, to kind of um, support both of those access methods. So just the implementation technology, again, we're using AWS and we're using AWS services where appropriate. And I'll have more on this on the next slide, but S3 is the cloud object storage. We're using S3 standard for our data products that are, that are immediately available to the public. Um, and then we're using S S3 Deep Glacier um, for our level zero data. Once we generate products using the level zero data, we don't distribute that publicly. So um, there's no reason to keep it available online for immediate access. Um, we're, we're more than um, uh, happy to move that data to lower cost um, glacier storage. Kubernetes is what we use to do our container or orchestration services. And we actually use um, AWS's um, EKS service to, to do the AWS uh, implementation of that. Um, again, our level zero through level three processing systems are all containerized. Um, in AWS, we use Aurora, which is their relational database capability. And the nice thing about that is that it's compatible with the Postgres based databases that we currently use on premises. Um, again, I, I mentioned uh, SQS is used to provide that message queuing and middleware functionality. And then we use Lambda functions to provide these event-driven serverless computing capabilities. So for example, initiating, initiating new processing when data arrives. Um, the core system components are built from these legacy multi-mission Landsat 1 through 9 processing systems, PGEs, that we currently run here at Eros in a virtualized environment. Um, the cloud-based systems will be containerized using, again, using uh, Kubernetes as the orchestration system. And our development approach is to use open source packages and technologies where it's possible um, and rely on vendor-specific capabilities where they make sense. So there's been a lot of discussion over the last day or so about vendor lock-in and avoiding vendor lock-in, which is a good thing. Um, 
when we look at the implementation, if it's a six of one, half a dozen of the other decision, certainly we want to lean towards open source solutions. But at the same time, um, vendor specific tools should be used when not using them would significantly complicate the design or hamper the capability of the system. So for example, Lambda functions are powerful and they don't really right now have an open source equivalent, at least not one that plugs into the AWS environment so well. <coughs> um, Aurora database, again, it's compatible with Postgres and it doesn't change your database design. I mean, in theory, you could, you could install Postgres in an EC2 instance and run it that way, but there'd really be no reason to do so. So the bottom line is we, we're really looking to balance this desire to completely avoid vendor lock-in with the risk of making a system that's so generic that it ends up being less capable and more complicated to maintain. You end up with a system that's sort of a jack of all trades and, and a master of none. Um, the Landsat Processing and Distribution System in terms of the standards and international standards as part of what we did with Collection 2 and our cloud migration, we're standing up stack metadata records for all of our products, which are very important, becoming more and more important as users interact directly with data in the cloud. Um, our products are, are using uh, cloud-optimized GeoTIFF COG extensions um, in, in our data structures, and we're moving more towards XML JSON-based metadata records to, uh, to augment our existing um, legacy metadata files. In terms of system efficiency, um, one of the things about cloud is that unlike on-prem, you know, you're paying for each CPU cycle. So it's important to make sure that your processing algorithms operate as efficiently as they can. So as part of this migration, we've identified changes to our existing algorithms, primarily our level three algorithms to make, um, uh, to, to make, their, uh, make them more efficient. Um, and then finally, in terms of open source science, um, obviously all the data is publicly available. Beyond that, all of our Landsat algorithms and our ATBDs and description documents are also publicly available. Um, all the calibration parameter files for Landsat products um, are published um, and available for public download, as well as all of our auxiliary data. So our, our atmospheric data is available, the elevation data that we use for terrain correction, the ground control points that we use for precision correction are all fully available on the Landsat Mission website. The full source code to all of our USGS processing systems, including like all of our production control and interfaces and things like that, that's not publicly available, although this requirement is being reviewed for future consideration, particularly as we move more into the cloud and we use more standardized infrastructure and, and interfaces. As far as the, a lot of topics that we've been having for discussion internal to the USGS, there is considerable interest in this, in this idea of authoritative data products, this documenting and preserving um, data provenance, um, particularly in the age of cloud computing where multiple or competing copies of data set can emerge. How do you manage, you know, what's the authoritative copy of, of, of say Landsat level one data and Landsat level two data? So we've been talking a lot about that internally. And it's a good problem to have because that's a that's that's a factor of making the data more available and more readily accessible to the to the user community. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. But I'd be happy to take any uh, questions that you might have. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate that. Um, so we are you got us back on time. Thank you. Um, so we're at uh, eleven thirty three over here. Um, We'll go into a 10 minute um, Q&A now with the, uh, with the working group. Thanks. Um, so, let me, sorry, just pulling this up. Um, so our first question is actually for Joseph. Um, so Joseph, I believe we still have you um, for a yes. minute. Okay, great. Um, when you say that NCCF had to update the business model, um, what does that mean? And specifically in the context of the system architecture, were there cyber infrastructure um, components or updates that were needed to support that new business model? Sure. So what I, when I say that, it means there's uh, people and process and uh, the way we procure. Um, people, some of our people aren't trained um, in the cloud. So we have to ramp up their expertise so that they can support this going forward. Um, procurements, typically, as I mentioned, satellite uh, program shows up with their own infrastructure. Now we're asking them, um, we don't necessarily need you to buy racks and stack these servers there. We need the algorithms and we'll, the algorithms and the latencies necessary and we'll support it uh, with the NCCF. Um, and those things were the two biggest hurdles. There's a lot of little stuff. How do we write contracts now to support 
cloud infrastructure versus on-premise infrastructure? Um, what do we do with data centers that we may not need? So the businesses had to change. Um, FISMA, yes, the things that we still comply, we still have to comply with FISMA, but uh, there is a shared responsibility model with the CSPs. That's why everything we use has to be at the minimum FedRAMP moderate certified before we're allowed to turn it into turn it up in production. Um, so those are the things we had to look at, and those are things we still are working on. It's the people and process and the contracts, but as the infrastructure, we've got the FISMA moderate, and we're gaining ATOs on that infrastructure. So I think we've got that piece worked out, um, but it's going to be a continuous process. Mm -hmm. So from the architecture perspective, it's sort of you were building in sort of some component or module for cost accounting of shared services as opposed to purchasing these purchase orders of hardware. Is that a correct interpretation? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so we do have we do have costing models. So people are always asking, well, what's it going to cost me to produce this algorithm? Well, it depends. That's what we had to tell them. But we have an idea now of, uh, through the models, how much it's going to cost to run X, Y, and Z infrastructure. Um, those architectural decisions are based on the cost because we have to optimize. Um, some of that kind of stuff is don't spin up all the instances at once. Slowly turn them up as we need them type thing. Um, I don't know if I answered that question. To yeah, satisfaction. I, think, I think you did. Yeah, thank you so much. So I think um, I do want to just kind of before we jump over um, to um, Chris, I want to sort of follow up on one other um, component here, which it sounds like, you know, you've really moved to this shared services model. And so was there any cultural hesitation experienced in moving more and more processing away from disparate systems than having something centrally um, managed? Yeah, there is a, um, this is my castle, you can't, you can't come and play um, attitude and that still prevails, um, but it is more focusing folks, focusing people on looking at the overall organization and what's best for the organization, what's best for the United States taxpayer. Um, I've heard this term before, it's called white, white collar welfare that we are engaged in. So instead of paying the money out to all of our very capable contractors, we could do a solution that benefits the government and the taxpayer. So that's the push. Now, that's my opinion. Uh, man, my management might not uh, say the same things, but that's that's the push. It's how do I provide the taxpaying public the most services with the money I'm given and make sure it's robust, make sure it's scalable, make sure it, ex make sure it can deliver what we're, we're tasked to deliver. Um, that's how I drive the programs forward. And whenever I have these advice and assistance meetings, I tell them, this is what you should be looking on, thinking of. So I try to frame it in that way. And that takes some of the territorial problems, uh, puts those to the side. They're still there, but I have people focus on something different. Thank you so much. Um, so for Chris, you mentioned analysis ready data tiles in Landsat MDPS. Could you please comment on what kind of support is available for this tile and your experience with providing analysis ready data? So support in, in what sense? Ching, I'm gonna ask you to come off mute and just, just describe what you were thinking there. So, um... The reason I ask this question is there's always uh, there seems always be a learning curve for the scientists to use your system to generate analysis ready data products. This means that um, you know the MDPS architecture design needs to uh, provide uh, support, uh, uh, both including both the infra infrastructure support and maybe the training support and later. Uh, the data production support to uh, scientists generating this this type of products. So my question is really about this. Sure. Um, the, the analysis ready data tiles are are a relatively recent addition to the Landsat product suite. But the nice thing about about ARD is that unlike the Landsat um, level one and level two scenes, where it's really based on the WRS scene frame, which can 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 vary based on your orbital ground track and things like that, the ARD tiles are based on a fixed 150 square kilometer 
um, grid systems. So if you download a series of AR details, they all they always have the exact same spatial extent. We do have um, documentation in the form of data format control books and, and other sorts of user documentation that, that are available on the Landsat Mission website. Um, but what we are seeing is that the AR details are, are rapidly becoming um, the, the, the data set of choice for users, particularly users that are doing some of these time series analyses because you don't have to do any additional work to sort of line up the data when you're, when you're doing some of these sort of four dimensional um, analyses. Is that, is that kind of what you were asking? Uh, yes, and then can I ask a follow-on question, Natasha? <laughs> um, I oh, would like quick. to actually, yeah, I actually wanna jump over to one of these other questions that I think are really highly valuable. If that's okay, Ching, maybe yeah, yeah, you can follow up. Okay, yep. um, so this one's back for you, Joseph. Is all your data in the cloud? You mentioned that there's also high-performance computing processing cluster. So is the, the system currently operational or is it in development? You know, and if it is operational, what are the lessons learned you can share about having data in one or both of these places? Uh, we do have a high performance cluster run by PBS Pro as the top level scheduler. Um, it, it is scheduling against containers running on EKS, um, uh, Docker containers, EKS. That's how we're managing some of this stuff. The data is in Amazon. It's in S3. It is production. Um, we are producing operational products from it. Um, and we are migrating our legacy applications from our on-premise systems into the NCCF as we speak. Um, part of the problem is getting the data providers able to send us the data in the cloud versus the way they've done it in the past. So we, um, we are working with our data providers and hoping they can push directly into Amazon. Sometimes they need an intermediate intermediate step like SFTP, FTPS, but that's the goal is to get everybody pushing data directly to Amazon and then we process it there and it is operational right now. Um, not for everything, but slowly we are getting there. Great, thank you. Um, so this next question is actually for both of you. So I wanna allow some time and then um, Ching, if, if we have time, we can come back to you. So um, have NOAA and USGS considered S3 intelligent tiering for certain data sets? Um, this actually came from the chat. So my, I'm reading directly here. My guess is that there is widely uneven distribution of, for example, Landsat data, a large fraction of scenes that are used very infrequently. So there might be considerable storage savings from that model, or is that guess wrong? And it's actually cheaper to just use S3 standard by default. So I answered in the chat and uh, I'll just expand. I said, yes, Am uh, Noah is using S3 intelligent tiering. What we found out is um, the majority of our orders from for Noah data um, are from one year of observation. So what we're gonna work, what we're working towards is keeping one year's worth of all of our data readily accessible. That's in the Amazon's top tier, uh, most expensive tier. And as that one year, that's about 80% of our requests. And after that, we'll start rolling it off into lower tiers and eventually it'll all end up in Glacier Deep Archive, which is the least expensive tier that Amazon offers. Um, so that's how we're handling it. And uh, <laughs> for, your, for your information, one year's worth of data is gonna be approximately uh, we think we're thinking three to five petabytes right now. Okay. And I just want to make sure that's like the most recent year that we're like, like T minus yes. 365 days. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Chris, do you want to answer that? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, it's certainly the case that not all Landsat data is created equal when, when it comes to popularity. What we've seen is that, you know, data that, that acquire that's acquired, you know, less than 30 days, in the past generally makes up about half of our downloads. So that recent data is, is far more popular. So from that perspective, it would make sense to use something like intelligent tiering to keep that data on a higher tier and move it back. What we're concerned about is the, the scenario where I'm trying to do like a time series analysis of a field or some region of interest going back to, you know, say 1980. What we don't want to have happen is, you know, hitting a scene from 1982 and, and not being able to, to directly access that data because it's being moved off of a, you know, a lower tier of storage. So it's something that we've, we've looked at. Our, our preference would be to keep it all on, basically keep it all on S3 standard if we could. 
if the, if, um, if the cost issues become prohibitive, it's, it's an option that we're looking at, but we'd prefer to keep all the data um, immediately accessible because we feel like the best way that we can exploit the Landsat archive and allow the user community to exploit the Landsat archive is to make the archive usable. And that, and that means keeping that older data more or less as accessible as the newest data. So, but, th but that's a great question. And it's definitely something that we've looked at. And I think that actually is like perfect lead back to Ching's question about the analysis ready data, which you said was really important for the time series analysis. So Ching, do you want to follow up with your question now? Uh, thank you, Nadaja. So it uh, sounds like you prepared the data in the tile format so the scientists can use it to generate uh, analysis and an analysis ready data. Then do you allow these data to be ported back or uh, you know, to the data system? If so, is there any like quality um, uh, control uh, procedure there for this type of uh, ARD data? So, you know, and, and part of the discussion here is there's always, there, there's always some um, confusion and questions about what the term analysis ready data actually means. Um, and this, this goes back to lots of discussions that we've had internally and with, with some of our other partners and other agencies and, and, you know, both here and abroad. The ARD tiles are really just the level two scenes that have been um, reframed into that 150 kilometer by 150 kilometer um, tiling scheme. So there's no sort of reprocessing that's done with that data. It's literally just another way to, it, you can think of it almost as just a different way to window that data. So in terms of the QA that's done on it, there's really not a lot of QA that's done above and beyond the QA that we do on our normal standard products. It's, it's just another more convenient way to actually access that data, if that's helpful. Yes, thank you. You bet. I, I think that's all the questions we have, unless there's something from the chat. Um, I don't know if someone wants to raise their hand, but it's hard for you to speak. So it's probably easier for you to put it in the chat. Otherwise, we can have three minutes to get up stretch before we go to the breakout rooms. Um, just to... We've got, we got a 10-minute break, so... Oh, okay, great. And I see Elias actually raised his hand and he has speaking privileges. So go for it, Elias. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, there you go. Hopefully I'm off mute. Question for Joseph there. Your presentation was very intriguing for me. Uh, in, in terms of seeing where you guys are headed. Uh, there was there seems to be a running theme from a lot of the missions that I heard previously that they had on-prem infrastructure and that was one of the motivations for continuing to use that. How were you able to get past that? You know, obviously NOAA has that same issue. There must be a lot of on-prem infrastructure in previous legacy. How did you guys make the transition and what was the motivation? What were the strategies you used to convince that this was the right move? So we have um, <clears throat> we have a a lot of top cover from our management. Um, they were pro going to the cloud. They saw the ability of it to scale to meet our needs, and they knew that our current path was unsustainable. So um, where we did logical breaks was, can we get some of this processing into the cloud before the tech refresh happens. That's one strategy. Um, you have aging hardware and you can't run it anymore. Where are we going to find new hardware? Well, you can maybe emulate that hardware in the in the cloud, in the VMs. We also had a lot of the stuff on premise was we had virtualization clusters on premise. It's just we could not scale to meet the demand. Our leadership wants us to take on more and more um, partner data. And there's no way that the on-premise systems could do that. Um, literally, our floor space was filled up and we, you know, some of our facilities can't handle the weight of all that, all that infrastructure, right? So these are physical problems we had to overcome. The cloud was an easy fix. Uh, initially, it was, well, I'm not sure if this is going to work. Um, I'm very nervous. I want to try for myself. And we've gone beyond that point. Now you have to tell us why it won't work. Um, there may be a latency issue. Like if you want to directly from a satellite to the infrastructure, there's a latency speed of light issue. That might be something we look at. But then we go back and ask, is that really the issue? Or is it you just don't want to give up your system? This is These are the kind of conversations that are difficult that need to be, uh, need to be held. And what we stop people from doing is, uh, I'm not sure if my product can make it. Well, what is your product? It's a web server and a database server. I don't think it should, I don't think it's going to work in the cloud. <laughs> that was kind of the initial 
push back, we're past that. We don't even entertain those kind of conversations anymore. Now people are behind it, management is behind it. Now folks are coming up with unique things. Hey, I want to use AIML tools. Um, I want to convert everything to czar and use Jupyter Notebooks. These are the kind of conversations we're entertaining today. So uh, it, it, it took many, many years and it takes um, somebody with strong will for the leadership positions. And then it takes strong will for the folks that are actually on the program implementing this stuff. Uh, it's not, it's not, I wouldn't say strong willed. It's just, you need to understand what you're dealing with and be ready with examples of how it's going to work and how it could benefit those folks. Excellent. Thank you so much. And we actually are at time. I want to make sure that we do get that 10 minute break that Andy spoke of. Um, so we'll repost the survey link um, just as the last thing for everyone to think about in the chat. And a reminder that today's breakout sessions are exactly the same as yesterday. You're welcome to go to the same one or a different one. Um, and we'll see you in those breakouts, unless Andy, you have anything else you wanna add? Um, just at that, um, two of the breakout rooms only had a couple people in there. That was the uh, system operations and the data analytics uh, analysis um, breakout rooms. So if you're undecided, if you're new, um, or if you feel like jumping over, um, we welcome you in those two topic rooms. Uh, so let's return in uh, 10 minutes. Thank you. And thanks to the speakers once again. Okay. I think we're at the uh, end of the break. So um, I, the plan here now is to do um, breakout sessions for 30 minutes, followed by um, um, a 30 minute report out, although it may be that we only need 20 minutes to report out, I don't know, we could always do 40 minutes for breakout rooms. Um, I'm not sure what the right plan to do there is. Um, and then at 4 p.m., um, Mr. Ochia from JAXA will be joining us at 6 a.m. in the morning for him. Um, and uh, he'll close out the session with a, or close out today with a, with a talk. Um, so can I pass this over to Paddy or the uh, working group to start the, uh, the breakout sessions? Um, sure, I'm happy to. Would you like me to schedule it for 30 minutes or 40 minutes? Um, does anybody remember how long the breakout reports lasted last time? Mine's, my, I was feeling it was 20 minutes. Is that correct? Does anybody remember? I, okay. thought, I thought they took up the entire 30, but that's just my, because I thought we run, ran over a couple of minutes, but it could have been just the whole schedule. Okay, so how about we do this? Let's, break, let's, go, let's go halfway. Let's do um, 35 minutes on the breakouts um, and 25 minutes of report out. Sound good? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open up the rooms. Um, Andy, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Oh, yeah. Um, actually, just before, oh, okay. Um, again, I just want to emphasize a couple things here. Um, so, topic areas on system operations and their analysis. It would be great if we could see some more people in those. And um, Paddy, we may want to talk about uh, some of us lost lost our, um, I don't know if you're going to say anything, but we were lost our video and uh, and um, microphone last time. So if that happens to you, so we've got a suggestion, Paddy? Um, well, the only suggestion I have would be to go out and come back in. I have activated everybody's cameras and microphones, so it would be a fairly simple process for them to do that. Unfortunately, I think that was more of a individual computer problem than a, a Zoom issue. Um, but by all means, if you if it happens to you, please just come back into the um, main room. I'll be there and we can troubleshoot it. Thank you. Okay. Um, and again, just like yesterday, you will see, hopefully you'll see a message um, that will give you a choice of what breakout room you want to go into. If you would like to change rooms, just come back into the main room and you'll be able to um, change rooms that way. Um, and I am here to manually place anybody in the room that 
doesn't see the message. So here we go. Okay. Uh, so I, um, welcome back. I hope nobody had any problems with the. I got, I got an echo on the line, so if you could mute, that would be helpful. Um, yeah, it's a bad echo. So, um, so now we're going to um, spend some time to sort of pull out on what was discussed in each of the sessions. Um, so we'll try and do this in 20 minutes, 25 minutes, um, and then we'll move over to JAXA, who is finally waking up um, uh, um, very early in the morning for them. But uh, um, So uh, let's move over to um, breakout room number one, and I don't have the information in front of me. I think that was the operations. Is that correct? Hey, good afternoon. Um, so this is breakout room one. We are on system development approaches and challenges. So um, yeah, we spent some time. Uh, sorry, uh, I should mention that Kurt Tilmes had to step away. So uh, he, he had to step out and ask that we, we help support the report out. Um, but there was a discussion about um, sort of how the uh, there's a lack of a common sort of vernacular when discussing the components of a mission data processing system. So we talked about uh, there was there was a very common architectural approaches we've seen in the presentations, and there are some minor uh, deviations on 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 how the language and terminology used. And we we talked about um, perhaps making a recommendation as part of this uh, this process, this study, to, to not only make a, make a recommendation on the architecture, but uh, an approach to communicating and um, discussing these architectural core components to a, a typical mission data processing system um, and making sure that that would enable the reuse and the findability when somebody says, I, I'm, I need to go and build a new system. And I'm looking at, you know, uh, I'm looking for a component that can help support ingest or a, com a component that can help support, uh, you know, a workflow. When when they're when everyone's using different terminologies, it can be difficult to to identify and, and find those uh, that may be available and uh, capable of supporting their needs. So, um, I think that was one of the the first findings. And then, you know, there was a discussion about the user needs and, and how broad they can be and, and you know whether this this is focusing on the entirety of all of those needs from you know not only the internal science team and, and the PIs, project scientists and, and members of the, the mission science team, but you know cross agencies, the public, um, you know, in the scope of this. And I, I think what what we sort of realized is that that it's difficult to, to constrain the scope to be just on the mission data processing system when it has such integration with the, the DAX and um, when there is uh, the requirement to provide sort of on-demand products and how those get generated in the processing system and how they get delivered out to the community. Um, and then there was also a discussion on the data formats and, and, and sometimes the formats that are agreed to between the missions um, and, and the, the DACs don't always lend themselves to support analysis ready data or there are formats that are maybe old and, and need to be converted or updated a little bit. So, um, you know, there was a, a mention of coordinate systems used by some of the older sensors that just are very difficult to translate into a current GIS, uh, you know, environment and they don't always have a transformation capability. So, and finally, there was a, a, a bit of a discussion on uh, cost comparisons and studies that you know demonstrate the return on investment of moving to the cloud uh, versus on premise over a longer period of time. And um, I thought it was a, a really good discussion about you know the trade offs between you know you you move from a, a, a less um, constrained environment as far as resources and infrastructure um, to one that comes down about how do you you know deal with egress costs and how do you understand um, the the update and, and maintenance approaches in the cloud. Um, I'd like to ask anybody from the team if they had any other comments or, or wanted to share. All right, thank you. Thanks, Luke. Um, so, that, so that was the system development. Now we'll move over to the system operations um, group, group number two, Elias. 
Yep, so let me uh, report out from our lively discussion. We had a, a small group of folks, but that allowed us to really dive deep. And we explored two main questions here that were posed. Uh, the first one was really inspired by the NOAA system. Uh, and we spent quite a bit of time discussing that the sort of the strategic direction where that system is headed, uh, the motivations of, of where it's heading, uh, even some of their interactions uh, with NASA and sort of the, the sort of agreements or even differences in workflows and processing uh, and their involvement, you know, such as using CMR and, and some of these other things that are being developed on this side. Um, we also sort of, you know, sort of try to look at it from the other side is what issues this kind of an approach um, will now create, you know, so, so something we were, we talked about a lot was cost sharing. Uh, when you have a multi-mission sort of system like this that can process data from many different sensors, how do you share the cost to know what's happening across here? Uh, and then the interdependency across these missions uh, as well, if, you know, one set of algorithms fails or something that happens from one side to the other, how is the system able to uh, continue working and supporting these kind of things? Uh, but definitely spent quite a bit of time there. Our, I think our sort of conclusion from that was, this is definitely a model for centralizing and achieving that efficiency. Uh, but there's obviously some issues that are raised as far as cost sharing and management uh, in, in the technical side, coupling of, of these, these kind of things. Uh, the second main question we, we uh, explored and dove deep into was, uh, what do the end users of these uh, of, of an operational system and, and an MDPS uh, type of system, what do they want that they're not getting today from these operational systems? Um, and we sort of came away with two, uh, you know, a few things that we discussed, but main thing was sort of a, a lowering of cost and yet at the same time, a lowering of latency of production. So more produce more products and produce new products, do it faster, more efficiently with lower cost. Seems to be a, uh, a theme there. Uh, and the other thing we dove a little bit into was ARDs uh, and, uh, was mentioned that it is a bit of a loaded term, right? How do you make an ARD such that it's it's, a, it's meeting the needs of a, a large set of folks where it may not be tweaked for uh, one use case versus another one? So we just sort of talk about how that is something that seems to be a need, but maybe there's still some fuzziness exactly what that is and, and what that can look like. But there's definitely a need and we hear that. Uh, those are the main takeaways from this room. Okay, thanks, Elias. Um, let's move over to session three, which was the open source science, and uh, I believe Natasha is reporting out on that. Actually, Evelyn's going to do it. Um, so we talked about. Um, needing to document um, in the architecture um, the mechanisms um, such as cost models that are needed, um, internal policies, um, as well as um, recognizing the contributions um, made from um, science teams. Um, more mechanisms for capturing the contributions and being able to credit that um, back to the contributors. Um, as well as take into account any hitting overhead costs associated with this. Uh, there was also a recommendation um, for doing um, a cost model study in order to determine um, costs uh, to the science team as well as to NASA, um, not just um, cloud resource costs, such as compute and hardware, things like that, but costs for um, getting and maintaining standards of contributions from the science team. And also, we also talked about um, how to, um, well, really the questions, how to make proposal contributions easier, um, how do we get seed um, and maintenance um, funding for uh, community contributions, so things we need to uh, look into as well. Or was there um, any additional um, things the group wanted to add? Okay. Thanks, Evelyn.
appreciate that. Um, so let's move over to session four, and that was uh, Ching. Ching, do you want to present? Andy, since you have the notes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, sure. Um, so uh, we were a little bit all over the place uh, to start with, but I think we started sort of coming together um, towards the end there. I think for me, there were two takeaway notes. Um, the first one, and we were talking about data analysis um, uh, and interfacing with the um, mission data processing systems. So the two takeaways from me were, um, one is uh, we got to figure out how, we need to figure out how each PCC can um, better support the ESO missions. Um, there's a great capability that exists up in AIMS um, with relation to their um, high performance computing, which has historically been used for um, uh, modeling type applications, but are moving more into the analysis side. They have a capability which is um, uh, a very sizable capability, which is equivalent to a size of a, an AWS um, facility or a small AWS facility. But figuring out how we can leverage that um, into supporting the ESO missions is, is going to be a critical component for going forward. Um, so as we had some conversations about that. And the uh, second takeaway note that for me was um, that it's very difficult for scientists and uh, um, to move into the cloud. Uh, some of the missions are, are now you know, used to doing a lot of on-prem work. They see the advantage of moving into cloud um, for their scientists to be able to come in and work in a collabor collaboratively to uh, work on common problems. Um, but the the developers and engineers that are helping them do that, um, it requires them to have quite a big spin up time. Um, we heard somebody said, you know, he's been working at 18 months and he's still learning. Um, uh, and so it, it's a big spin up time to, for them to be able to move into the cloud and understand uh, and leverage all the, all the uh, capabilities. So there was some discussion about, um, it would be helpful if there was uh, um, best practices, um, support that helps train people um, and a lot more kind of like a centralization of how how we all how we all move as a community into that cloud environment. Those are the two uh, that I took. Um, uh, Ching or Wenying or anybody else. Anybody else want to add to that? I think you captured all. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Andy. Thank yeah. You. Great. All right, so let's uh, move over to the uh, open source software approaches. And uh, uh, Andy McAllis has uh, got that one. All right, so the perception is that uh, the NASA processes are inconsistent with NASA policy for open sourcing software. Uh, the feeling is that the process is unnecessarily complicated and ill-defined or poorly communicated. It does not feel streamlined. Um, we do have some you know, high-level policies and directives, you know, things that are posted on Earth data. Some of the cooperative agreements have release language in them, but there appears to be some confusion about um, you know, how to go about doing these things. And we said that it, we'd be hard pressed to meet the uh, OSS goals without changes to current processes and policies. Uh, it might be worth having a working group that could look at some of the specifics of this and maybe make uh, recommendations to kind of determine what that membership composition of the group might look like. We need to have sort of a broad sense of all the unique challenges, what they really are, and thinking larger than just NASA because there are you know, other larger government requirements, mandates for releasing software, and how that all might fit in. Uh, projects appear to be very resource limited. Um, you know, they don't have the people to go through these release processes. Um, you know, and should we be paying these highly skilled scientists to, to, to kind of wrangle this, this um, you know, there, I know there are some support groups, uh, you know, sprinkled throughout the agency, but there appears to be hard to navigate, like someone mentioned there's different websites for different pieces of the release process and how that might happen. Um, and then just another, an aside, we found out that user interfaces are required to be 508 compliant, which is an accessibility requirement. <laughs> I did not know that. Um, so one of the uh, uh, breakout members had a lot to say about that. So anyway, that's that's kind of the rough take home messages for today. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and the last but not least, uh, Hook, I'm going to talk about MDPS architectures. Right. Uh, we actually had a very good and very lively discussion here. I think there were a few handful of key takeaways from this. Uh, one of the first things we discussed together was 
uh, the recognition that there seems to be an overlap of the functional capabilities between what we're discussing here with these MDPSs uh, and what DAX uh, and, and the DAC analysis do effectively. It's the construct of you know what happens before the archives versus after the archives. I think the bottom line of what we discussed was that even though the scope is different, but there seems to be overlaps in the functional capabilities. It's something I think for us to consider. Um, we also discussed the roles of the importance of uh, analytics inside the MDPS. Uh, I think uh, just this was rooted from the example uh, from the Jedi SOC, where uh, having an integrative approach to not just processing, but rapid iterations of you know assessing assessment of the data products, the processing itself, the analysis, and rapidly iterating back to the processing itself. That was a, a key uh, aspect that was brought up. Um, we also discussed the use and reuse of MDPS for on-demand processing. So this is both in the context of the mission scope as well as what, what happened later on uh, after end of mission and even being done by the, the DAX as an example. But certainly what was brought up was uh, the implications of the, the color of money and funding between a flight project and an Estes DAX. Uh, we then discussed uh, and actually differentiated between the notions of identifying common services with an MDPS versus the notion of having centralized services. I think uh, there were a few discussions about comparing it to Cumulus, which is a common capability, but deployed across different projects versus say CMR, which is more of a centralized service. Uh, we then actually closed out the breakout discussion with the notion that um, it's more than just common services, but how can an MDPS elevate the aggregate to supporting more agile uh, capabilities, such as, uh, you know, quote unquote, science as a service, meaning that could we architect it in a way that would facilitate users building their own higher, you know, higher level science as a service capabilities. Um, and I think this, this then was the last topic was to get to this science as a service, we need to have well-defined interfaces, but this is not interfaces for the MDPS developers, but really this is more about having well-defined interfaces for the users, meaning the algorithm developers, the science community. And uh, I think we close it out by saying or acknowledging that to do this, we really need to work with the science culture instead of, uh, you know, instead of enforcing approaches, how, you know, we need to work with them from the get-go to see, you know, what are some potential approaches that's commensurate with, with the culture. Um, I know, is there anything else that uh, we discussed that I missed? Um, I think these are the key things that I got from our notes. Okay, thanks, Hook. Appreciate that. Um, so we're going to keep collecting all these notes into the on our Google Docs, and so that we can um, use all of it later. Um, so that ends the breakout sessions. Um, so I'd like to do one more talk, um, and uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Osamu Ochia from JAXA. Um, appreciate you are coming along here, um, Osamu. Uh, it's the middle of the or the early morning for 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 you, and uh, um, so I appreciate you uh, finding the time to come come and join us. Uh, just quickly uh, for everybody, uh, Mr. Ochia is a senior engineer at the uh, Satellite Applications and Operations Center at JAXA. Um, he's in charge of the international cooperations between um, on the EO program and how we use data, um, satellite data is utilized. Um, he's also a contributor to the GEO um, and the CEOs for EO um, sharing. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, and uh, you have 15 minutes to tell us all about uh, the great work that you're doing over there in, in JAXA. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Can you show me? Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you uh, 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 inviting me this uh, really nice opportunity for me actually uh, uh, for this. And then uh, this is early morning for us. And, and good. Uh, and I think uh, you, you guys already in uh, almost three are close of business today. Uh, so just uh, uh, let me just uh, briefly introduce uh, the, about what JAXA's uh, perspective for the open source science in Earth Observation Program. So my name is Osamu Chai as a senior engineer for SAOC, so there's the Applications and Operations Center in JAXA. Uh, uh, I'd like to just talk about what is going on in our site. Uh, let me just uh, uh, turn off uh, my video so that uh, it might be some sort of a conjunction will be happening. 
Okay. Uh, so uh, as you know, that uh, JAXA has been operating Earth, of, uh, Earth observation missions for more than 35 years since our first EO satellite, uh, which is a marine observing satellite, MOS-1, which was launched in 1987. And since then, we have a, a kind of a bunch of uh, satellite mission flew, and, and then we have a couple of uh, international cooperation missions, um, particularly with NASA at the most, and several from European and several maybe Asian. Uh, but you know that, the, from, for example, the Japan-US uh, Joint Precipitation Mission uh, Trim and also the GPM is uh, a kind of uh, statue for our, our cooperation. And, and you know, this it has already been a long-standing and accumulating its data for more than 25 years. And we also have uh, some key missions like uh, l one SAR missions uh, stands for the ELOS, and uh, JLS-1, ELOS, and ELOS-2 right now. Uh, since 1992, and the microwave radiometer missions like uh, AMSAR E onboard aqua missions and uh, others uh, follow missions since uh, 2002. And uh, we have uh, some uh, first uh, dedicated mission for the greenhouse gas observing mission, uh, which is starting from the 2009. So we have a, a kind of a, a long standing EO data assets, and these are the really critical for the societal benefit and the global challenges. And JAXA is planning follow on missions as well as the new missions, new missions, and, and we are will continue to provide observation data to partners and researchers uh, all over the world. So let me just skip uh, a little bit uh, one slide and then I'll come back to the, uh, the one uh, in the before. But uh, this chart shows the overview of a JAXA ground system for Earth observation missions. There are a couple, uh, dedicated components for respective uh, uh, dedicated EO missions uh, by satellites uh, as shown in the green text, and which are for the data processing and data storage, uh, including MDPS just used, you, you are just talked. Uh, and while uh, there are common facilities as shown in the blue text, and we also have uh, for data that requires a large amount of the computing resource for processing, we are also using a supercomputer system in JAXA. Uh, we, uh, as shown in the blue text, uh, we have a couple of uh, common uh, infrastructure and the D portal you see on the uh, right hand side, which is a system to the gateway of JAXA EO dataset to, your, to the users. We are considering migrating a cloud-based platform and mainly uh, common facilities. And then we are starting from the G-Portal system, how we can migrate into the cloud-based platform. And coming back to the slides, uh, the slide shows about how the Geo uh, JAXA uh, EO gate data gateway to various users. Uh, as you can see uh, on, on the left-hand side, we have a dedicated uh, mission operation system and G-Portal in the central and the users in the right-hand side. Uh, the G portal to provide access to uh, JAXA EO standards data for various users, such as general, researcher, commercial purposes, and, uh, and some administrative users. And uh, the G portal also uh, interface with the commercial based service providers, cloud platform pro providers as well. The G portal also supports the category interoperability with international standards for the global users to find search for our data sets. Uh, for, uh, for example, uh, we have uh, commonly uh, provided uh, such a catalog to the sales uh, uh, interfaces and also the geo uh, platforms as well. And moreover, from April this year, uh, uh, this uh, digital ob objective identifier DOI will be appended to the all the JAXA standards products so that it will be expand, uh, expected to be easier to search and access as well. So this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, we are making some sort of a, uh, efforts to, 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 to comply for the international standards, as well as more searchable for, for the users to find out our data sets. So uh, that this chart uh, identify, uh, indicates that JAXA's portals to provide its data and user interfaces. In the previous three, uh, users has to access, uh, this is a really a common problem, but the uh, user has to uh, identify which portal should be accessed so that uh, user has to access G portal in case for standards product access. And then P users has to access other semantic portals for more value, value added products. But recently, uh, a new one-stop portal we called Ask Graphy in JAXA, 
which was launched for the users to access entire, uh, entirely for JAXA Earth observation data information. So Earth Graphy is an overarching website providing comprehensive information of JAXA satellite data and their user use cases. So uh, we, we also have some sort of a making efforts to best uh, user-friendly interfaces to access uh, users uh, more and more uh, in convenient way. On the other hand side, this, uh, this is a kind of an overview of what, how the intellectual properties uh, concerning to the JAXA your data and information assets, which are open and free or protect, protected or licensed. I would like to particularly note that uh, many data processing software and tools are not intended for public use at this point. Therefore, they are currently very limited and openly access. And in terms of the JAXA Earth Observation data, JAXA revised uh, the data policy uh, in the principle in 2017, and open free provision is for five meters or more coarse resolution. In case more than five meter higher resolution in general, in principle, uh, for example, that the LOS2, uh, which is high resolution L1 SAR data cases, uh, which uh, that is the case for the higher than 10 meter resolution, these data sets are distributed to limited to joint researchers or partner agencies who have signed the agreement. The general user can purchase such higher data from private distributors. However, we, we are some making some reasonable efforts to open up those uh, data sets as, as, as much as possible. We are now trying to uh, negotiate. Uh, in this regards, LOS2 advanced data cases, we started to open free provision scans of data sets, uh, which is a little bit coarse resolution, like a 50 meter or 100 meter resolution still, uh, which have already been distributed to the Alaska Surf Facility SA, for, ex for example. Additionally, we must comply with the Japanese Remote Sensing Act, which came into force in uh, 2018. That is a basic law uh, legislation that we need to follow up and in our system as well. And in terms of data analysis algorithm, software and tools, currently some simple tools and also that ATBD are freely open to public. But as mentioned before, most of the existing algorithm so software and tools are not intended to open to public. As they are contain know-how and third party IPs, this may be one of the critical topic, how, we, how far we need to change the situation in the future. So this slide shows how JAXA currently cooperate with the space agencies with regard to research and application around the world. Uh, there are many research applications, such like as weather forecast, disaster risk management, climate change, agriculture forecasting, rapid urbanization, uh, that we provide exchange various satellite data and value-added products for promoting cooperation with these partners. As you see that the NASA, we have a lot of data exchange uh, for various applications area and research areas. I'd like to just uh, introduce a couple of examples for activities uh, concerning on uh, relatively uh, for the open science activities and also the research uh, activity. Uh, this is, as you may, as you may know, uh, example of the cooperative open science initiative between uh, space agency as our observation dashboard launched by JAXA and NASA ESA into, uh, in, in last year. So three agencies jointly analyzed satellite data on the changes in the global environment socioeconomic activities before and after COVID-19. And in June 19, uh, 2021, JAXA collaborated with NASA ISA to organize a hackathon to encourage globally, uh, globally to users uh, of data information in the dashboard. And the JAXA also launched ourselves in the JAXA for Earth on COVID-19 dashboard in the parallel at the same time. This is another example of the cooperative open science activity currently under developing JAXA with our universities and also the forest research management organization for algorithm development of biomass mapping and promotion of application research. And JAXA has a strong l sar data assets to be used for development of the global biomass mapping, which could contribute to global GHG think and source estimation. It is essential uh, to validate satellite-based uh, biomass map with ground data and also the aircraft rider data and estimate uncertainties among them. 
So uh, we are developing a corporate research platform, so-called uh, JAS4B, Japan Satellite Forest Biomass Research Network, to share satellite ground and aircraft data and analysis, to analyze, uh, analysis tools. We are very much expecting to collaborate with the NASA ESA mission analysis uh, algorithm and analysis platform, MARP. Uh, we have already conducted uh, some level of cooperation and we would like to expand more on this, on this cooperation. And JAXA is cooperating with the commercial service providers as one of, by example, uh, it is a uh, cooperation with the Google Earth Engine, of course. Uh, we provided value added products and analysis ready data to Google Earth Engine. Uh, for example, ALOS2 uh, scanner ALD uh, have already been uh, posted and will be increased chronologically uh, from April uh, 2022. In addition, we also provide analysis software for live clock monitoring. For example, we call the INAHO uh, for use or in the Google Earth Engine environment. We are expecting to accelerate developing of a new application solutions on the on the uh, such a commercial platforms. We are also engaging with the local government in Japan for their use of such application platform uh, for for uh, solving their their uh, local uh, social societal uh, issues. So this slide shows a government in initiative for satellite data utilization. Uh, Toulouse, uh, this is an, our uh, uh, national uh, government data platform name, which is aiming for enhancement of such a data utilization for business purposes, launched by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan, METI. Uh, on this uh, Toulouse platform, space-based data and AI and software are available to users for business uh, develop development. And JAXA provides a barrier satellite data to the Toulouse uh, to see how satellite data utilization for business purposes can be expanded. So we are thinking and assuming that if uh, we want Earth observation satellite data to really take up or take root in society, uh, based on this uh, assumption, we need to provide its value in the socioeconomic field. So that I think we believe this is one of the new area to tackle on. Therefore, we are starting preliminary, uh, preliminary studies of satellite data in economics and society, uh, social science research. So from 2020, uh, JAXA is engaging with the experts in urban engineering area uh, activity, uh, and also that, uh, uh, let's see, just a second, please. Yes, uh, some sort of uh, other uh, area in the health area, and also the public uh, public health area, and also some uh, urban engineering and so on and so forth. And we hope to have some uh, coincidence between Earth observation uh, data analysis results with the uh, socioeconomic effects. So that is uh, we are now studying with those uh, professor in university to see how uh, coincidence can be happened can be find, found in, in, in these studies. So uh, I think this is uh, really a new area to tackle on how also observation data can be analyzed uh, towards the use of the socioeconomic areas. So uh, this is just my last slide to summary. Uh, in response to the global trends uh, towards open source software, we have already made some sort of effort for open source science in our observation programs such as uh, improvement enhancement of satellite data search and dissemination capability. JAX has also studied the collaborative uh, partners, uh, including a commercial service provider as well. There are of course uh, challenging existing in terms of data, especially high resolution data. We need to consider the framework with a public private partnership for data distribution and also to adopt information security policies such as the remote sensing act. We also need to secure necessary budget for storage of hu a huge amount of data. And furthermore, many software and tools contain know-how and you know, third-party IPs. So uh, such factors are constrained to open them to public immediately. This would be uh, one of the big topics to discuss uh, for us. And we would like to know what, how to deal with in NASA and other agencies. JAXA starts preliminary concession of the open source software 
Uh, further discussion is needed for necessary cost and IP policy. Therefore, NASA's OSS initiatives could be a model of case in, in Japan as well. So we expect, uh, I'd like to interact more with uh, your colleagues to see how the, uh, we can collaborate with each other for the future, uh, future, future capability. Thank you very much for my talk. Thank you very much. That's a fantastic report um, uh, talk, and it's so great to see um, the opportunities that we could um, we can benefit by collaborating with you. Um, I think I'm going to pass this over to the System Architecture Working Group and Tasha and Elias to see if they have any questions. Um, Yes, no doubt. We do have some questions here um, for you. I know it's a bit at the end of the day, uh, but we'll try to get through these quick and hopefully get some good responses. And thank you for joining us uh, early in the morning. Uh, first question, uh, you mentioned that there's a desire and, and some efforts towards moving to the cloud. Uh, do you sort of see the next step as a hybrid system where you, you have your on-prem and you have some cloud, um, or is it a sort of a plan to go totally into the cloud infrastructure? Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, actually, that uh, we are not planning about the entire system into the cloud at this point in time. We are gradually uh, to see how uh, which system can be uh, feasible to go into the cloud. As you can see on the slides, our, our dedicated uh, mission-specific system in the green. These, these are still in our dedicated on-premise uh, system at this point, but while our blue, blue components, which is more common facility infrastructure, that could be a target for the cloud uh, transition. So, and particularly focusing on the G portal system, which is a data dissemination or search capability, this is a target system to transit to the cloud at this point in time. That makes sense. And I think it's very much aligned with what we're hearing from the other uh, sort of presenters that there are certain pieces and certain parts and that, that are moving into the cloud, uh, but sort of an overall, <clears throat> excuse me, longer picture uh, that still remains to be seen. So the next step is more of a hybrid system. Uh, you also have a lot of end users. Do you allow your end users to run services onto your system? I know they, they come in to search and, and sort of pull data, but can they actually execute stuff onto your system as well, submit uh, request for processing. Are you meaning about the user can allow to access to the uh, each individual uh, dedicated uh, mission uh, MDPS, for example? Exactly, what? right. So if, if an end user wants to reprocess some of the data that you have in a little different way or different parameters, can they do that? Or is it just a verbal thing and then you have to do it for them? Actually, yeah, this is, uh, for us, uh, this is a later part of uh, options. Uh, we are not uh, currently allowed for the user to access our internal system to execute for the reprocessing for whatever others. So we are just uh, taking note from the user requests and see how we can uh, execute such requests into our systems uh, and uh, not, not from user side uh, uh, initiation, but ourselves to initiate to, 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 to do so, yeah. Yeah, and the motivation for that question was really to see if you face the same issues as far as getting access into these systems um, that we've seen from some of the other parts as far as end users. Um, but obviously, that's not something you're dealing with. Uh, sort of a, a, a larger question in the JAXA strategy area, right? Um, you obviously have an on-prem system. You're looking at moving into the cloud, certain pieces of it. What do you see as the future architecture for this system that you guys have? Do you, can, do, you, do you see it as, you know, next missions, next sensors continue adding to the same thing? Do you see a big move somewhere? What's that longer term strategy look like? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this is a really hard question for us to answer at this point in time. Yeah, we, we definitely need, uh, we definitely desire, we really desire to have such a strategy. However, uh, our, this might be a, some sort of restriction. Our organization structure may be same as you, but maybe you are more, much more feasible, uh, uh, flexible. But at this point in time, our structure of the government, uh, our JAXA structure is uh, mainly uh, consisting on the project basis, like uh, as you see of the uh, satellite based. And then of course, our common infrastructure system, uh, we have a ground system common in, uh, system developing team. However, 
uh, the size or uh, you know is a scale is a different, and so that uh, when coming to the new mission system, they have already developed their own uh, dedicated system and to add on the entire ground system. So that uh, at this point in time, if new missions come, uh, we are adding, adding on the green components attached, and then we have to modify for the common infrastructure enhancing and uh for 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 to adopt the entire ground system and then but but we we know the data volume is increasing and how we can and but just just a kind of <laughs> case by case to conservation at this point in time but we, we definitely recognize about the needs for the ground st strategy towards the future sorry about this yeah. mm. no i think you answer that question is really continue building the existing system and continue building on it and expand into the cloud for certain use cases that make sense and see where the future holds right there isn't necessarily a a larger push and it's driven by almost by the needs and the requirements uh last question for you at least from this side and then uh we'll, we'll open it up and see if any of the other uh SOG members have a question for you uh you had shown map on there and obviously map is something near and dear to us uh from the the jpl side and the nasa side um what is that cooperation look like is it more just data sharing uh, is there actually services? Is there is there a, a, a technical connection there between MAP and, and your system? Uh, it's not yet happened. This is how my my <laughs> actually desire to cooperate more strongly. And uh, uh, as you see on the chart, uh, our side system just 4B is not yet happened. Uh, we are now currently under development for uh, uh, you know sharing the two data sets and so on so forth for the Japan uh, biomass data uh, development. Once it is happened, uh, we would like to uh, share our data and the tools and algorithm as much as possible with MAP. So that is our expectation to cooperation. And then uh, as you can see on the top, uh, we are uh, trying to scale up uh, for the global biomass map development of uh, starting from the national scale uh, to the regional scale and the global scale. And for the global scale, we can collaborate much more uh, we, between the, our platform with the map uh, because MAP is, uh, I think NASA is, uh, is already uh, this sharing about the data and tools in the global level. However, we are starting, our strategy is starting from the national scale and the scale up, uh, scaling up to the regional and the global. So uh, this is just just idea to see how we can uh, stepwise to uh, collaborate, sharing all the data platforms, uh, software and tools, if it makes sense. Yep, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for that. And, and again, thanks for being able to join us so early in the morning. Uh, that does wrap up our questions and I know we're, uh, we're at our time limit as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Elias. Thank you, Osamu, again. Thanks for coming in so early. Um, so that concludes today's session. Thank you to all the speakers. A excellent day of um, talks. Um, and thank you to all of you for participating in the uh, work uh, breakout groups. We really do appreciate your input. Um, we will resume again at 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern time uh, tomorrow. And uh, we'll continue this current session of uh, listening to the uh, international community. And, and I believe we then go on to a few other non-Earth science mission um, architectures. So that should be interesting too. Um, so once again, thanks again and have a good evening.